This conference will now be recorded. All right, so let's talk about head and spine injuries. So some of the more common things that we come in contact with with a traumatic injury would be the head and spine. Um, and if you're working in a near a water facility or closer to the water stuff, you usually get a lot more head and spinal injury type calls um, and whatnot. We'll get more into that as we move forward here. All right, so head, neck, spine, everything that we do uh, deal with as far as, excuse me, the nervous system. So the nervous system obviously is a complex network of nerve cells that enable all parts of the body to function. So that would include the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nervous system, which we'll dig right into here. Uh, a little bit about terminology, obviously the head uh, trauma refers to uh, both the head injuries and traumatic brain injuries. So we're gonna get a little more in depth in T, uh, TBIs. Uh, so a head injury is a traumatic injury uh, to the head that may result in injury to the scalp, head, or skull, but not including the face, okay? Um, the head injury and traumatic brain injury are frequently used interchangeably. So we talk about TBI stuff um, and how it works in conjunction or interchangeably with the head, head injury or that traumatic injury that happens with that. So a TBI would be an injury to the brain caused by an external force. And a lot of times people have long-term effects from that traumatic brain injury that they have. They get put in different facilities. Uh, there used to be one right in New Hampshire, local to where, we, we, uh, where I currently work in Effingham, which is now a detox center. It used to be uh, Lakeview Neuro Rehab. But there is another one in Freedom as well, Neuro Restoration Center. And there's also like Kenny Bunk, Maine has one um, over on Cat Mousem Road. So there are, there are, they are out there. So if you are in a facility or are working for a service that has a TBI center, um, with that being said, just get familiar um, with the facility, the patients that are in there, the types of conditions that they do have as well. So spinal cord injuries or SCIs um, are devastating. Uh, TBI is a substantial cause of death and disability. So a little bit more about some AMP. So the nervous system is divided into, into the central nervous system. So think of that as in as in your, your head down into the spinal cord down, then everything off of that breaks off into the peripheral center. That would be the PNS or the peripheral nervous system. So the CNS is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, as you can see on the screen here. So start off with the brain, the sensory and motor areas of the brain, the spinal cord comes down and it'll go straight down the spine as well, All right? So with there, there are nerve endings and everything else, so connective nerve, um, connecting uh, nerve cells as well as sensory impulses. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So the voluntary activities um, are actions we constantly perform, anything voluntary, things that we can do. So taking your hand, picking up your soda bottle and taking a drink out of that is a voluntary move. Involuntary activities are actions that are not under conscious control. So breathing being one of them. So we can hold our breath, but eventually something will stimulate. And we'll get into that and more in the respiratory stuff later on. But the uh, it will cause with the carbon dioxide will cause us to take a breath and, and and breathe to help maintain pH status. And we'll get into that here in a little bit too as well um, when you talk about chest injuries in the next chapter. <clears throat> so if you take something here like for example where it says sensory nerve endings and extremities, you touch something hot, right? It has to then take and in, 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 um, transfer through the nervous system, the nerves, right, into the peripheral, into the central nervous system, into the brain and say, oh, that's hot, or you should be touching that, and it needs to come off. But it happens instantaneously, right? Now, there are conditions that are out there, though, however, and I'm drawing a blank what it's called, um, where they have no feeling, they have no nerve, like the nerve endings are there, but they don't have that, the feeling of saying something's there, something's hot, something's cold. There is a specific name for it, I can't think of it. I'm just drawing a blank right now. Um, I'm sure someone's looking it up on Google for me. That'd be awesome. Uh, I, I just can't think of it. So it's it's like neuropathy, um, but it's but it's not. So it's they have no feeling, but it's it's they're they're born with this, and it's a specific disease process. But neuropathy would be um, obviously loss of nerve endings as well, right? That we would find uh, in patients that um, like diabetics, things like that. Um, that have destroyed the nerve endings within their, like usually their extremities moving up into their core, which is why neuropathy is so important to pay attention to, especially with cardiac symptoms and things like that, because they can have, um, 
they can have uh, atypical uh, chest pain. So they may have like upper upper gastric pain or back pain because and they could be a specific MI because of that. All right. So a little more review of the scalp. It's com com composed of multiple layers, right? So the subcutaneous tissue contains the majority of the vessels supplying the scalp itself, all right? Um, the last so or laceration or, comp uh, or other compromise of these vessels can result in a profuse hemorrhage, which is why that we have small little lacerations of the head. We have significant bleeding, right? So we show up and they have a small little, a little scalp laceration and you walk in and it's like, holy crap, where all this blood come from? Well, it's a very, very vascular area, right? So the laceration or the other may compromise these vessels, right? So they compromise them, they profuse, profusely bleed. Um, with the skull, you have the cranial and facial bones, okay? So as you can see here, um, these little lines that you see through here are, are like sagittal sutures. Um, we have the different um, lobes of the brain underneath the skull. So if you think of the lobe, it's the same name as the top would be the skull, right? So the frontal bone. Um, occipital bone, uh, temporal bone, parietal bone, right? Going into the nasal bone that comes into here. These are orbits or orbital bones here. Um, going into the zygoma, the cheekbones or the zygomatic bones. Maxilla is the top part of the jaw. Water part of the jaw is the mandible, okay? These are the zygomatic bones here, as you can see, kind of going down. So zygoma is here, zygomatic comes down. And obviously the teeth are located there. One of the most, um, one of the most, fractures that we're going to see uh, with patients like this, or patients in general that have facial injury, most likely will be an orbital fracture. So what we're looking for um, is bruising around the orbit. So you just, what you do is you take your thumbs and you can kind of push on that area and see if you can feel any kind of um, fragmentation or crepitus or a significant pain increase on pushing. You usually can tell if there's an orbital fracture or not. So if we do have the bruising around the eyes, what is that called? Everybody should know this one here. Bruising around the eyes. So Justin, you answered the question for a basal skull fracture. That'd be bruising raccoon behind eyes. the eyes. Yeah, raccoon eyes, exactly, perfect. So those are the things we wanna look at when we're doing our trauma assessment on top of looking for any kind of CSF. So remember the mandible is the only movable facial bone, right? So as you see, mandible moves up and down, right? Um, the cranium is also occupied 80% of the brain tissue, 10% blood supply, and 10% cerebral spinal fluid. So we want to look for that, though, right? We want to look for CSF as well, any kind of significant skull fracture. So we look at that battle sign. So when you're doing your head-to-toe head -head assessment on your rapid, you want to pick up on raccoon eyes, battle signs, and getting into the throat, obviously, like, you know, the tracheal deviation, the JVD, you know, some of these things that are very important to pick up on. Um, and a lot of these things, like, for example, if you have a patient with battle signs, it's remember that uh, NPAs are contraindicated as well. So the brain connects uh, to the spinal cord through a large opening at the base of the, of the skull called the foramen magnum. Um, so there are four bones that make up the cranium, the occiput, temples or temporal regions, parietal regions, and frontal region, right? So think of temporal, like I mentioned before, temporal, frontal, parietal, um, and underneath that would be your different lobes of the brain. And they have to stay the same name, except it's not the Frontal bone is a frontal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, you know, temporal lobe, things like that. So the face is compromised of 14 bones, um, including the maxilla, the zygomas, and the mandible. The orbit is made up of the frontal bone and the two facial bones, which I showed you in the last photo or picture. Uh, the nose is consistent, consists of flexible cartilage. So there is a bone that comes in your nose, but then it turns in the flexible cartilage after that, okay? <clears throat> um, remember the spine, kind of quick review of this here, remember there's 33 vertebra, vertebrae that are there, uh, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacrum, and 4 coccyx, right? Remember that the sacrum, right, are they, are they fused or unfused? Please remember the answer to that one there. Right, so they're fused bones, right? Five bones are fused together. Remember that the axial skeleton as well, um, I forgot to mention that part. 
The axioskeletal components there are stabilized by ligaments, joints, um, capsules, and muscles as well. So this is more of a in-depth picture of the spinal or a spinal process, as you can see here, or the spinal cord or vertebrae. So if you look inside here, the anterior versus posterior, this would be the outside. You have the spinous process here and the transverse processes on the outside. So as you're doing your assessment, you're palpating, you're trying to see if there's any, if you make sure you can feel all the spinal processes. You wanna make sure you can feel that, that bony, the bony arch that's there, right? And if as you're palpating and you feel it's shifted or moved, there potentially could be a fracture. You're also looking for any kind of step offs, okay? So anything that'd be stepping off to the side. So as you're palpating down, it's not just a quick rub down. You literally need to feel using your fingers going right down the spine and take a good feel of that. Look for any kind of step offs or fractures or any crepitus, right? Um, if that does happen, any one of these bones here could easily puncture through into the spinal cord, causing significant damage. Right. Um, so the spinal cord located in the center. This is the bony process that protects the spinal cord. And then we have the nerve roots that come out of the spinal cord going into our system, the central nervous system, working into the parietals. And obviously the body, uh, the bone is down here. Uh, the intervertebral discs separate and cushion each vertebrae. Okay, so healthy people that should have good cushion in between. Um, these can wear down or completely be removed um, over time and injury and just stress. So stress in the vertebral column may result in injury to the spinal cord or a nerve root injury. Peripheral nerve injuries are nerve injuries that at the peripheral level or most prominent and most easily palpable spinous process is at the seventh cranial, or sorry, seventh cervical vertebrae at the base of the neck. So as we palpate down our neck, the most prominent is gonna be our C7. The vertebral column can flex and extend substantially. So extreme extension or flexion may damage structural ligaments, right? So we can have compression fractures, things like that, Heyman, Heyman's fracture. Um, so we look at diving injuries, right? So we have someone that dives in, they, when they hit the top of their head, they hyper, hyper flex, right? So that's head down to chin hyperflexion causing significant damage. So everybody takes their hand and puts it on top of their head and pulls down in the class, right? You go on a certain point and then go beyond that. That's where you start hyperflexing. Same thing with hyperextension. If someone hits their head in the bottom of a pool as well, they put their chin up into the air, right? That can only go so far before we start compressing those intervertebral discs in the, in the, in the vertebrae that are there causing significant fracture, right? That's why diving injuries need to be spinal mobilized in the water the best we possibly can um, onto a board and removed out with cervicology in place, right? Um, other things look for motor vehicle accidents and sputtering of the windshield, right? If you have spidering and you have significant frontal lobe injury, suspect spinal as well, because with that impact causing that hyperextension or potential hyperflexion, right, can cause our vertebrae to pop. That's your extreme extension reflection damage that we're talking about. So in here, in between the discs, I'm sure you guys can all see the mouse that's on the screen that I'm moving. Um, these will flex forward or backward, causing these in here to pop, right? Causing fractures. So the central nervous system or the brain um, is the center of consciousness. Major regions would be the cerebrum, the brain stem, cerebellum, the diencephalon as well. Um, most metabolically active and perfusion sensitive organ is the brain and totally dependent on cerebral blood flow, right? So if we have patients with head injuries, what can change cerebral blood flow? Swelling, okay, what else? Pressure. What else? Yes, yeah, swelling and pressure. Another one gives them the P. I know we've talked about this before. 
TBI patients. Any other guesses at all? You guys got this. I know you do. Perfusion. Thank you. Perfusion. And how can we measure perfusion again? How do we measure perfusion? End title. And what's our range we need to look for? 735 to 745. Okay, that's our pH level. Okay, so that's correct 30, on the pH. 35, 35 to 45. 45. Awesome, yes, everybody has said that at the same time, 35 to 45. So are we really ventilating to meet, uh, patients with TBI or traumatic brain injuries or injuries to the brain with swelling? We're not meeting to meet ventilation as much as we are meeting to meet perfusion, right? So we can tell how fast we need to ventilate a patient based upon their end tidal CO2 readings to make sure we're not vasoconstricting or vasodilating the brain, right? If we vasodilate, the bleed that potentially could be there gets worse. If we vasoconstrict, we're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. So we really want to make sure we manage that end title, that carbon dioxide off gas, so we don't vasoconstrict or vasodilate as well. All right. So we measure oxygenation with perfusion. Because without oxygen, the brain can also can't stay alive, right? So we never remember we have sugar, blood, and oxygen, the three things the body needs to stay alive, the brain to function. And if we lose one of those three, the brain will die. So we have to oxygenate and to ventilate to meet the perfusion status to keep the pH levels at a norm, as well as making sure that our, our carbon dioxide levels are within the normal ranges. That's why every trauma patient that has a suspected head injury should be put on nasal cannula and title to start. You kind of see where we currently sit. Remember, totally depend on cerebral blood flow. If you lose cerebral blood flow, the brain dies. The cerebellum, I'm sorry, cerebrum is responsible for higher functions. It's divided into right and left hemisphere, right? Uh, I'll get into that in a second. So the cerebral cortex regulates voluntary skeletal muscle movement or muscle movement, skeletal movements and levels of awareness where the frontal lobe is responsible for voluntary motor action and personality traits. The parietal lobe controls motor functions of the opposite side of the body as well as memory and emotions. The occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information. The speech center is located in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe also controls long-term memory, hearing, taste, and smell. Which is why when we do an assessment, okay? Let's put this in the real world stuff here. So we're talking about assessment of the brain. We're talking about us doing a neurological assessment. For those of you who have worked with me, you've seen me do many of these in the field. Um, we start asking specific questions to the patients, right? So we look at the voluntary skeletal movement and level of awareness. How do we check level of awareness? Right? You might have to unmute for a lot of this. How do we check? How do we check level of awareness? Level of status? Are some place time, time place with event? Yeah, exactly. Person, place, time, and event. Okay. So how do we check voluntary skeletal movement? Have them do something. Touch your touch your pointer finger to your nose. Voluntary movements can be move, right? Frontal lobe is uh, is um, responsible for voluntary action and personality traits. So we're measuring personality traits by talking with somebody else, asking the family, is this patient normal? Are they acting differently, right? If there's no family around, we can look for voluntary motor action, right? So again, voluntary skeletal movement, voluntary motor action. Can you move your finger? Can you touch your finger to your nose? Uh, parietal lobe controls motor functions of the opposite side of the body as well as memory and emotions. So how do we measure short-term memory? How do we assess it? Um, give them a, a number, something to remember. Come back in a minute or two and see if they remember it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I usually do five different things. It, make sure you write those down, by the way, London. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause you may forget. Um, but that's how you check, you know, your short-term memory. Right? 
think of five different things, simple things you can remember and write them down five minutes later, check it again, see if they remember what they are, right? Short-term memory loss. That would indicate head injury, all right? And we talk about parietal lobe controls that, the memory part of it, so it could be a parietal lobe injury. Also controls uh, functions the opposite side of the body. So if we have someone squeezing, you know, hand to hand, is one side weaker than the other. Occipital lobe is responsible for visualizing or processing visual information, right? So as we're doing that, we can say, do you have any blurry vision? Yes, is that normal for you? No, okay. Well, you hit the back of your head, so we can have a parietal lobe injury. Speech center is located in the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe also controls long-term memory, hearing, taste, and smell. Can you still smell and taste stuff, right? How about long-term memory? Remember what's going on, where you live, what year it is? Those are all long-term things. All right, so do that assessment, go through it all. Find out where the head injury is actually located. Do your best ability. I mean, obviously we need x-ray, I'm sorry, CTs if we get this stuff out. But again, assess them. The cerebellum coordinates body movements um, where the brain stem controls virtually all life functions. Um, consists of the uh, midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The reticular activating system, or RAS, is responsible for maintenance of consciousness. Uh, the control centers, uh, or the centers of control, um, basic, that controls basic but critical functions are located in the lower part of the brainstem. The basal ganglia helps also coordinate muscle movement and posture. The pons are, uh, sorry about that. The pons contain numerous important nerve fibers, including those for sleep, respiration, and the medulla, uh, medullary response respiratory center. The medulla serves as a con uh, conduction pathway for ascending and descending nerve tracts. And the spinal cord transmits nerve impulses between the brain and the rest of the body. So let's take a look at this really quick. Right, looking at the layers of the brain or the skull. So the meninges prote are protecting layers that surround and enfold the entire central nervous system. If the meninges become inflamed and infected, what would that be? What would be the technical term for that? The diagnosis. Meningitis. Meningitis. Yeah, exactly. All right. So the outermost layer is a strong fibrous wrap, wrapping called the dura mater, as you can see here, the line going across. So if I said the patient has a subdural bleed, where do you think that bleed would probably be? Where are my arrows showing you? Under the dura mater. Under the dura mater, it bleeds right there, right? If you have a, then you have the arachnoid, and then you can have what they call a subarachnoid bleed, which would be the arachnoid, right? So patients can have injuries to these. And if you're involved a lot with interfacility transport, you'll be able to actually see a lot of these scans and things like that you ask for them and you may transport patients and have head bleeds. That's where they're coming from. Um, the meningeal arteries are located between the dura mater and the, and the skull. The secondary meningeal layer is a delicate transparent membrane called the arachnoid, right? So delicate layer, right? Easily have a bleed there based upon impact. Um, the third meningeal layer is the pia matter, which is a thin, translucent, high vascular membrane. So you have the dura matter and the pia matter being located down lower, closer to the brain. Right, so you think of this, the skin, right, the fascia, the muscle, right, and then we have the bone, skull right here, right? That's a solid bone, correct? Pretty solid, I would say. It protects a lot of us. So let's think about an injury to the brain. If we have an increased swelling or a bleed in the brain, where is that blood going to go? Where can it go? Can it go through the skull? No, it's gonna pool. So just you're right, path of least resistance, right? But you can only put so much pressure up against the bone before it starts pushing down into the brain, okay? This has path of least resistance, right? Most resistance is up against the bone, so it can't go any farther, 
if you have an open fracture where the bleed can come out, right? So it's just pushing against the brain. By doing so, it causes more and more damage. I wish I had some scans to show you in this presentation, but I do not have that, right? So we gotta remember that we need to get herniation exactly. It compresses the brain to the point where the brain can herniate. Right, we start seeing what they call hemispheric shift, um, where you start seeing your midline of the brain start pushing towards one side. You start seeing that shift, that midline shift. That means you have a significant intracranial pressure. And normally, these patients are unconscious. Um, those are ones usually end up getting intubated. So the peripheral nervous system has 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Okay, so it's 31 spinal, 12 cranial. The somatic nervous system regulates or controls voluntary activities. The autonomic nervous system controls the functions of many of the body's vital organs over which the brain has no voluntary control. Things that happen automatically, right? Cranial nerves then pass through the openings in the skull and then they transmit nerve impulses directly to form, directly to or from, or sorry, directly to or from the brain. Okay, so we have 12 cranial nerves. Uh, peripheral nervous system conducts sensory impulses from the skin and other organs to the spinal cord. So the sensory nerves um, carry information from the body to the brain via the spinal cord, where motor nerves carry information from this central nervous system to the muscles. So connecting nerves allow cells on either end to exchange messages and the connecting nerves in the spinal cord um, form a reflex arc. So I'll show you guys this in the next photo here. So the connecting nerves in the spinal cord form a reflex arc. So the sensory nerve in this arc detects an irritating stimulus that will bypass the brain and send a direct message to the motor nerve. So as you can see here, hand over flame, the ouch nerve impulse is coming through, right? It says, this is not right. Back around it goes and says, take your hand off of it. All right? So that's where that reflex arc comes into play. So how do we make sure a, a patient has good reflexes? What can we do to check that? Can we check that? Do we check that? You can rub the bottom of your pen or the you pen across the bottom of the foot or tap them on the hand with it and see if they withdraw from it. Okay, I like it. So that's checking sensory, motor, and I mean, I'm on, right, and sensory motor impulses, right? So circulation, CSMs. So we're checking motor function, we're checking peripheral function like that by just taking and feeling, is this sharp or dull? Taking a pen, does, is there a feet ticklish? Is there toes fan out or curl in now you'll see more of that in pediatric with something called a Babinski reflex as well right so there's different things you're looking for and based on different assessments so when we do in-person classes coming forward uh, and I'll have a conversation with Laurel on for Sunday's class uh, in regards to going over a in-depth neuro assessment um, for you guys to be able to practice during your medical assessments so you have two different autonomic, the autonomic nervous system splits into two, right? We have what they call the sympathetic nervous system, which is controlled by the hypothalamus, right? Sympathetic nervous system being the fight or flight. So a spinal cord injury at or above level of T6 may disrupt the flow of sympathetic communication. Our parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for conserving energy right, or maintaining organ function, what they used to call the feed or breed one, okay, everything's slowing down. Disruption of the lower parasympathetic nerves in the sacrum result in a loss of bowel, bladder tone, and sexual function. So with head injuries, there are two types. Obviously, there's open and closed. A closed head injury, which is most common, which is associated with blunt trauma, results in skull fractures, focal brain injuries, and diffuse brain injuries as well. And often complicated by increased intracranial pressure, ICP. 
So how do we know if someone has increased intracranial pressure? What are the three things we can look for that shows a patient has increased intracranial pressure? Fluid leaking from the ears. Okay. That could be one or would be one. What else? Would they so, be No, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Would they be hypertensive? Okay, there's one of them. What else? So I see Michael put on JVD. You're looking more towards Beck's triad with the JVD. We're looking at the battle signs, raccoons, eyes, stuff like that. Okay, so there's more uh, in, in injury pa patterns. So Justin just came up and said Cushing's. I'm going to go with Cushing's triad, not Cushing's syndrome, right? There's two different things. So you're mentioning Cushing's triad, I'm assuming. Okay, so Sean had one of them, hypertension. What are the other two? There's two more to that. Yep, irregular respirations and bradycardia. So those three things would be Cushing's triad, which, in, which indicates increased intracranial pressure. So we gotta make sure we pick those up. The widening pulse pressures, exactly. So the hypertension, or the widening pulse pressures. All right, um, with open, <clears throat> excuse me, with open head injuries, dura matter and cranial contents are penetrated at this point in time. So GSWs are usually the uh, most common, uh, almost always leave a substantial neurological deficit, neurologic deficit and decreased quality of life. So they have the same signs and symptoms following the injury, the patient who exhibits one or more of the signs and symptoms listed on table 30-1 in your text, should be evaluated promptly in the emergency department. So scalp lacerations are small lacerations that can quickly result in significant blood loss. We talked about injuries to the scalp being very vascular, right? So significant blood loss can happen. In any patient with multiple injuries, bleeding from the scalp or facial lacerations may contribute to hypovolemia. Right, so indicates indicator of deeper, more serious injuries as well. So how are we gonna treat patients with hypovolemia? Fluids, bolus, right? So IV fluids is correct, and I like, I like um, Michael's way of putting down bolus, getting the fluid up, right? So what are we trying to meet? We talk a lot about shock and, and um, for those of you that are online now that work for action, I just posted something on Blink in regards to shock um, at 10 o'clock this morning. I went out as a saved post. So again, how, I mean, how do we fix it? What are we looking for? We talked about how we fix it, right? stopping the bleed, giving the bolus a fluid. Are we trying to maintain systolic blood pressure? Are we trying to maintain diastolic blood pressure? Or are we trying to maintain a map? I mean, arterial pressure. Uh, I'd say MAP first and then systolic second if, if we're right. going. Yeah, I would go down the same route as well. We, we talk about, and Justin makes a good point, we always talk about systolic blood pressure around 90. And that's what pre-hospital trauma life support teaches you. Where they're going to now is making sure you have a decent MAP. What is our mean arterial pressure? We look at it in sepsis, patients that are hypovolemic that way, right? There, okay, we look at sepsis, a septic shock, as a map of less than 64. We don't look at systolic and diastolic blood pressures anymore. We're still there. We still look at them, but they're not the indicator, not our goal, right? So we want to make sure the body's perfusing appropriately by utilizing end tidal oxygenation, SpO2, everything else. We also got to make sure that we have fluid to push it around. So really what we're looking for now is the mean arterial pressure. Okay, that's kind of what the, we're looking towards now versus just systolic blood pressures. But Justin, you're not wrong by any means. Are you wrong with that with that statement, that answer? Because pre-hospital trauma life support still teaches systolic blood pressure around 90. But if we have a patient that has a significant laceration and they're bleeding somewhere, right? What are we losing? 
what is the body ridding of? What is it? What are we losing there? Platelets, right? And red blood cells. So now we're losing our ability to clot. We're losing our ability to transport oxygen. And all we're doing is flooding the patient with more and more and more and more fluids. And then the patient becomes, I'm not going to say hypertensive, but a systolic blood pressure of, let's say, 140. We're just going to push more and more fluid out of that wound site, correct? And what does the patient really need? Blood yeah. products. Yeah, blood products. Michael, you're, Mike, you're correct too as well. Hyperthermia becomes an issue too as well, right? There's a lot of things that play into factor with patients that are bleeding other than just blood coming out, right? Understand the pathophysiology behind it and how we're going to fix this problem. All right, we look at um, perfusing a patient. We look at oxygen in a patient, but not to the point where we're pushing so many radicals around to the point where they end up not perfuse or not 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 perfusing, um, not meeting our homeostasis that we're looking for. Okay, so look at our mean arterial pressures when you're looking at trauma patients as well. Are we meeting that goal? So look at these um, two here. Okay, so what would you call these two? Top one would be raccoon eyes, right? Bottom one, battle signs. These are our two we're looking for. These are open or closed. Signs would be deformity, visible cracks in the skull with a scalp laceration, ecchymosis, which is bruising under the eyes, or ecchymosis behind one of one ear over the mastoid process. We have, ooh, excuse me, raccoon eyes and battle signs. So again, raccoon eyes here, battle signs here. This is significant damage. Okay. Uh, I've seen a lot of this myself personally. I've seen more of this in nursing homes with falls, things like that. So, what's one question you want to ask these patients other than are they, un are they did they lose consciousness? What's another question to ask? Yeah. Thinners. What was that, Lennon? Uh, blood thinners. Blood thinners, exactly. Right. Because this is continuing to bleed because now they're not clotting appropriately. So, just as an anticoagulants. All right, so the linear skull fractures or a non-displaced skull fracture, which account for most of the skull fractures that we deal with. A depressed skull fracture resulting in high energy direct uh, trauma to the head with a blunt object. Frontal and parietal regions of the skull are most susceptible to these, right? So you have your linear skull fracture working your way over, right? So A, B, C, and D. So I have some pretty cool x-rays of patients that I've had those skull fractures before. It's been actually neat and not good for the patient, but pretty cool for teaching. Um, remind me to show you guys those another day. I have them on my phone on one of our in-person days. Um, the bony fragments may be driven into the brain. So patients often present with a neurologic sign, signs like unresponsiveness being one of them. Uh, the basal skull fracture, or especially with high energy trauma. Here's what I found. Really? Okay. Um, associated with high energy trauma, signs would include CSF drainage from the ears, raccoon eyes, or battle signs as well. Um, and then open skull fractures or brain tissue may be exposed to the environment, which is a very high mortality rate, as you can see in picture D here. Right. Um, one of the ones that I have on my phone is a nine-year-old ski accident that was actually over in um, Abenaki and Wolfboro and the calls I had when I worked over for Stewart's, um, except the depressed fracture that's here was actually located on the frontal lobe here while still wearing a helmet. I got permission from the parents to have this news in classes. That's why I'm discussing it. Um, the presentation of the child when we arrived on scene was altered, kind of moving their head back and forth. No C collar was placed on this kid. Um, just sitting there in the nursing in the, um, in the nursing station with the nursing lounge um, in the clinic, kind of just moving their head back and forth. As Soon as I walked in the room and saw that, I called for flight because I knew this kid had to be at a trauma center right away. Um, so we transported the kid. Uh, we got all the clothing off, everything else, got lines in place and everything else was already done. Um, maintaining airway management and as we get there 
um, the kid starts vomiting blood, just lots and lots of blood. So Dart finally showed up, um, medicine Huggins in the uh, helipad, and the kid was RSI and intubated um, in the back of the ambulance and transferred to main med. The kid made a full recovery and was back skiing, you know, the next season, but full recovery. We picked up on something right away. So look at the signs and symptoms that were all there. The kid had a significant frontal lobe injury with a bleed. I don't know my little stories about EMS that we had. So traumatic brain injuries, um, there are two broad categories, primary, direct, and an injury, and then a secondary injury, or indirect injury. The primary brain injury or injury to the brain and its associated structures that result in instantaneously from impact to the head. Where a secondary brain injury results from this um, from the sequel of the primary brain injury, like cerebral edema, intracranial hemorrhage, increased intracranial pressure, infection. Uh, let's see what else is there. Uh, cerebral ischemia and hypoxia, or hypoxia and hypotension, which are the two um, potentially preventable but significant causes. Secondary brain injury can occur um, anywhere from a few minutes to several days following an injury. So we talk about the secondary injuries here. We see a lot of these patients in nursing homes. Um, again, I mean, a lot of these I saw working for Stewart's in, in uh, Wolfboro. Um, I was out of that base for as many years as I was. And we could call, call the local nursing home for a patient who's unresponsive. And are they on blood thinners? Are they on blood thinners? Yes. Oh, by the way, they fell a week ago and hit their head on the floor. We didn't think anything ever put them back in bed. So that's your secondary brain injury right there, right? Um, we we had that happen quite often um, with patients like that. So if you could call the nursing home for an unresponsive, one of the questions should be asked is, did they have any recent falls? Usually, if I slip and fall out of bed, they usually put them back in the bed and they and they move on with their day. They don't see any injury, even though they had a head strike and they didn't pick up on it because it was an unwitnessed fall. Um, so again, keep that kind of stuff in mind when doing your assessments and asking the appropriate questions. So a lot of times you may respond to that call. I'm sure most of you on this conference call here um, have probably been to that type of call before where the patient was unresponsive in the nursing home and they were found that they had fallen seven days prior, right? Or they went to the hospital and they were scanned, everything was fine, they sent them home. It doesn't mean there wasn't a small fracture they probably missed and then they got bigger and bigger or a small bleed, I should say. Um, that can be picked up on initial CT, but seven days later, the patient's almost dead. So keep that kind of stuff in mind um, as you're treating your patients as was there a previous fall or traumatic injury. Um, motor vehicle crash is the most common cause of brain injuries, um, the coup contra coup injury, where the brain strikes the front of the skull and then um, then into the rear of the skull going back and forth, back and forth. One way to picture it, like I mentioned before in other lectures we've done, is take a walnut, put it inside of a bottle that's filled halfway with water, and shake it back and forth and watch what that walnut does, right? And you're gonna see that. And that's what your brain is doing inside of the fluid inside. And it'll end up causing the significant injury that you're seeing here on the screen. So significant bruising and swelling to the front and back based on the brain going back and forth, right? Um, so the injured brain swells initially because of the cerebral vasodilation. The arm going boom, 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 back and forth, back and forth, uh, causing that significant trauma. So the cerebral edema that can, uh, contributes to further swelling may not develop until several hours following the injury. Low oxygen levels in the blood aggravate cerebral edema, right? The patient should not be hyperventilated and only indication for hyperventilation is signs of cerebral herniation. Hmm. So how do we measure that again? You know how we're supposed to ventilate? Everybody should be saying end title, end title monitor. Everybody's still there. All right, perfect. Hi. Yes, end title. Yes, yes. No, yeah, good, good. Okay, let me make sure. Um, so, common response to head injuries is vomiting. So, as I described in my nine-year-old incident that I had, significant vomiting of blood. The appearance of clear or pink watery CSF from the nose, the ear, or an open scalp would indicate that the dura and the skull have been disrupted. Seizures are not uncommon. A lot of times what they'll do at the hospitals is they'll preload a patient with Keppra with significant head trauma to prevent any seizures from happening. 
that's the goal behind that. Um, so remember Cushing's triad, which we already talked about, um, signs of effects of cerebral edema and increase in the cranial pressure. So increased blood pressure, narrow, um, irregular respirations, decreased pulse rate are your three things you're looking for for Cushing's. Intracranial pressure or bleeding inside the skull from ICP um, can occur between the skull and the dura mater, beneath the dura mater and outside of the brain, within the tissue of the brain itself, or into the subarachnoid space. So we have the subdural bleed, subarachnoid bleed, you know, things like that we could come in contact with. Uh, increased ICP squeezes the brain against the cranium. So healthy ICP in adults range between 5 to 15. Increased cranial pressure decreases cerebral perfusion, right? Pressure and cerebral blood flow. So with that, the cerebral perfusion pressure or CPP uh, pressure of the blood flow through the brain. The minimum CCP, CCPP required to adequately perfuse the brain is 60 in an adult, right? So auto regulation response would be to decrease CPP by increasing MAP, resulting in cerebral vasodilation and increased cerebral blood flow. So the body is trying to protect itself by increasing the MAP, resulting in vasodilation, which is bad, right? So we want to, this is where the end tile comes into play and in ventilating a patient based on end CO2. So we can not vasodilate, also not vasoconstrict based upon carbon dioxide in the system and the pH. So we can do a lot of regulation in the back of the ambulance using a BLS skill and for New Hampshire is end tile and BVM. So if the ICP is not promptly treated, cerebral herniation may occur, right? So as you can see, looking at the pictures here, the corticate and the posturing. So later signs or, or early signs of symptoms would be vomiting, headache, altered level of consciousness and seizures, but a later sign would be hypertension, bradycardia, or respirations or Cushing's triad, plus an unilaterally unequal and or non-reactive pupil, coma, and posturing. So the corticate or flexor of posturing or the flexor of the arms and extend extension into the legs. As you can see in, in picture number one, the top picture, was like that boxer stance coming in, right? The cerebrate or extensor posturing is extension of the arms and legs. The, the cerebrate posturing is worse than the corticate, okay? And this would be underneath your GCS score under posturing and the motor function, um, uh, actually tab, in a motor function assessment from one to six, okay? So the focal, the focal brain injury, specific grossly um, observable brain injury, as you can see here. Um, the brain tissue um, is then, retrieval contusion, I should say, is brain tissue is bruised and damaged in a specific area, which is different than a concussion because it involves a physical damage to the brain. The area of the brain most commonly affected is the frontal lobe. For some reason, we always seem to hit the front of our head. So swelling will occur and might result in increased cranial pressure. So we talk about the epidural hematoma, which is the accumulation of blood between the skull and the dura mater, um, resulting in a blow to the head that produces a linear fracture of the temporal bone, disrupting the middle meningeal artery. So the patient becomes unresponsive immediately following the injury which is then followed by a brief period of awareness or lucid interval. All right, so the subdural hematoma, which is the accumulation of blood beneath the dura mater, but outside the brain. Excuse me. Uh, most common intracranial hemorrhage, um, or may, and may or may not be associated with a skull fracture. So results from the rupture of the veins on that bridge the cerebral cortex and the dura. So the patient may experience fluctuating levels of consciousness, focal neurologic signs, or slurred speech, classified as an acute, subacute, or chronic. So as you can see in the photos here. 
where the hematoma is located on the brain. An intracerebral hematoma is bleeding within the brain and tissue itself, which have a high mortality rate, even if the hematoma is surgically evacuated. A subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding that occurs into the subarachnoid space. So you'd have bloody CSF and signs of meningeal irrita irritation. <clears throat> Some common causes would be trauma, a rupture of an aneurysm, or a arteriovenous malformation. Common cause would be trauma. We talked about that already. Um, of the patient also presents with a sudden severe headache. So the bleeding increases, the signs and symptoms increase of increased intracranial pressure will start to appear. So patients that have that, um, the stroke-like symptoms or the severe headache, when we're doing our assessment, if the patient has a severe headache um, locate or localized in one spot and it's the worst headache they've ever felt, they've been vomiting, suspect a hemorrhagic stroke, right? Don't rule that out. Keep that in, in, in mind, all right? Because it could be a hemorrhagic stroke type deal. Depending on where it's located, um, the patient could lose the airway or they may not. So again, just keep an eye on them, monitor their vital signs. And the last thing we want is the patient to be hypertensive that have a head bleed. So diffuse brain injuries affects the entire brain like a cerebral concussion, which is caused by a blow to the head or face if the brain is jarred around the skull, caused by a rapid acceleration deceleration forces or that coup contra coup injury. Other ones would be like a mild traumatic brain injury, which common features would be the direct blow to the head or a blow to the face, neck or elsewhere in the body uh, with an impulsive force transmitted to the head. Rapid onset. Um, so rapid onset of short-lived impairment of neurologic function that resolves spontaneously. Uh, neuro neuropathologic changes and range in clinical signs and symptoms that may or may not involve loss of consciousness. So it's impossible to rule out a concussion in the setting of a head injury with the transient neurologic symptoms that are there, right? So signs of concussion would be confusion, disorientation that may last for several minutes and amnesia. So you wanna ask about symptoms of concussion in any patient who has sustained a injury to the head, dizziness, weakness, visual changes, nausea, vomiting, ringing in the ears, slurred speech, uh, inability to focus, lack of coordination, delayed of motor functions, inappropriate emotional responses, temporary headache and disorientation. Right. We see a lot of um, patients now that are coming from sports injuries that are getting concussions. And, you know, back when I when I played sports back in high school and things like that, we were told, oh, it's a concussion, you're fine, go ahead and continue playing. Right? Things have changed over the years now. Coaches have to go through specific training on how to recognize concussions. Um, and if they recognize a concussion, it could be done for the entire season. There's a lot more concussion protocols in place now than there were when I was younger. Um, do we have any coaches in, in the class at all? London, you do a lot of stuff with sports anyways, and you've coached teams before. Did you have to go through any specific training at all? Um, yeah, so there's a um, uh, a specific course through, like, the MIAA and, like, something else. But basically, yeah, it teaches you how to recognize a concussion um, in the student. And then if they have – any type of symptoms that may mimic it or even um, simple things as far as um, uh, just even a headache. They don't even have to get hit, but if they, they have uh, certain symptoms, they complain to certain things, um, like I said, the grogginess is slow. It, it, there's too many, too many things to go on. So if, if they don't look right, they don't feel right, you, you basically sit them out because you'd rather be uh, overcautious than, I guess, undercautious. So, um but yeah, it's 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 good and bad though because um, I coach high school football, so the kids know that. So if the kids are being lazy, they don't want to practice. All they have to say is I have a headache, and they know that they don't have to practice now. So it, it's a double-edged sword. Right, right. And this is a mandatory class for all coaches. From yes, yeah, it's mandatory. It's um, <clears throat> it's tied in with that CPR and then the first aid and stuff. So if you don't have it, um, start of the season, then you're technically you're not allowed to coach with me on the field. So if anything happens, then um. 
um, like game wise, then you, you your team could basically forfeit their game of the season. Yep. But as you can see, the concussion protocols are getting more and more st stringent uh, throughout time, and it's come a long way compared to when I was younger playing sports in, in high school and all that, or even under high school, junior high, elementary school, whatever. Hey, question: If we do that for the national registry exam, do we get an automatic pass? <laughs> Well, I mean, I wouldn't try it, but I mean, I guess you could. <laughs> uh, my head hurts. Just pass me. We're good. I already know it. Uh, so did it. <laughs> oh, boy. We'll go we'll, um, we'll a couple more slides here. We'll finish up the pathophysiology and we'll take a break. So diffuse axonal injury or DAI is a severe brain injury often associated with poor prognosis, which involves stretching, shearing, or tearing of the nerve fibers. Um, with consequent axonal damage, resulting from high-speed rapid acceleration deceleration forces. Severity and prognosis depends on the degree of the damage is actually there, and it's classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Spinal injuries. Um, the spine can be injured in a variety of different ways. We talked about compression, right? So forces push on top, compressing the vertebrae. Injuries that can result from a fall. Motor vehicle crashes or other types of trauma. The mechanism of injury would be a vertebral fractures can also occur with or without associated spinal cord injury. Stable fractures pose less risk to spinal cords. However, unstable injuries involve multiple columns of the spine as well. So flexion injuries would result from a forward movement of the head, typically from a rapid deceleration or a direct blow to the occiput. All right, patients would also experience lateral bending as well. So inflection, compression mechanisms, the head moves from front to back and is overstretched on one side while being over compressed on the other. Rotation injuries, injuries revolt with C1, C2, so your atlas axis rotation. Um, and the areas of the spine are often unstable, resulting in high velocity mechanisms. All right, I've transported a lot of patients that have had uh, C1, C2 fractures before, right? So it's very slow moving, not rapid, <laughs> um, and a good stabilization. The vertebral column uh, forces are transmitted through the vertical bodies, which are directed either inferiorly through the skull or superiorly through the, the pelvis or the feet, right? Is there a vertebral, vert vertical compression? So typically result from a direct blow to the crown or a partial parietal region of the skull or rapid deceleration from a fall, which causes uh, fractures without associated spinal cord injury. This can cause a herniation of the disc, uh, subsequent compression, or some subsequent, subsequent compression on the spinal cord or the nerve roots and fragmentation into the canal itself. As you can kind of see the compression fracture located in the photo here. Hyperextension and distractions. Hyperextension can result in fractures of the bones and injuries to ligaments. Distraction occurs from rapid hyperextension, hyperextension of the skull, atlas, and the axis as a unit. Results when the parts of the body are pulled in opposite directions. The cervical region is most vulnerable to distraction forces because it has least support and protection. The most classic distraction injury is a hangman's fracture, as you can see in the photo here. Looking here, we're distracted by pulling these two apart. <clears throat> the lateral force results in a bilateral fracture of C2 with associated tra tra a traumatic um, of C2 on C3, the subluxation of C2, C3. So mixed mechanisms with some sort of rotation, flexion, or extension forces usually occur together. So you may see these rotational flexion fractures on patients that are doing surfing. As they come down and they hit their head off the bottom and their body rotates based upon the um, hydraulics of the wave itself. Obvious, other, um, obvious injuries to the head and neck may also indicate injury to the sp cervical spine as well. Um, 
So injury to the shoulders, back, or the abdomen may indicate injury to the thoracic or lumbar spine. Injuries to the lower extremities may indicate associated injuries uh, to the lumbar spine or sacrum. So injuries um, to the cervical area can limit the ability of the diaphragm to function fully and minimize the ability of the chest wall to fully expand. So primary, prim, uh, the primary spinal cord injury occurs at the most um, at the most movement of impact. So spinal cord uh, concussions is characterized by a temporary dysfunction that lasts 24 to 48 hours. Um, <clears throat> so spinal cord contusions are caused by a fracture, dislocation, or direct trauma. Mm -hmm. Secondary spinal cord injuries result from a spinal cord injury progressing uh, to further deterioration. So effects can be exacerbated by exposing neural elements to further hypoxemia, hypoglycemia, and hypothermia. So we want to minimize heat loss, maintaining oxygenation and perfusion are key. Right, so pulse oximetry and tidal CO2 monitoring together, um, and also keeping the patient warm, protecting the high heat loss areas, which would be the head, the sides of the neck, the armpits, the, the chest, the sides of the chest wall, and the groin. So placing heat packs in those areas or warm fluids um, can assist with keeping the patient warm. All right, I'll finish the slide here, and we'll take a break. Uh, spinal shock would be a temporal, a temporary local neurologic condition occurring immediately after spinal trauma, presents with a varied degrees of uh, acute spinal injury. Second, uh, sensory functions also below the level of injury will also be impaired. Um, usually it subsides in hours to weeks, depending on the severity of the injury. Neurogenic shock results in a temporary loss of the autonomic function. So classic case of neurogenic shock is a hypotensive bradycardic patient whose skin is warm, flushed, and dry below the level of the spinal lesion. <clears throat> All right. With that being said, let's take, let's come back at 720. We'll take 10 minutes. See you guys all at 720. Hey, Kevin. This conference will now be recorded. So with the patient assessment um, with these head injuries. We're going to ensure, obviously, ensure safety first, see and safety, BSI, so that we'll be constantly going over. Uh, decide whether the trauma system should be activated. Usually you can tell on your initial assessment, do we need a trauma center? Right, looking at mechanism of injury, death in the same compartment, um, patient presentation, does this patient need to be flown? Do they need to be at a trauma center? Can you take it by ground? All right, contact medical control, have a consultation. We have this patient, these symptoms, do they need to be at a trauma center? Do they need to be flown there? Make your determination. Does this patient need blood now, right? Consider the need for paramedic backup. Is there gonna be airway management? Do you need help getting IV, IV access if you can't get one? Um, what do we need to do? Consider our decision of whether to mobilize the patient depends on your local protocols, not purely just on mechanism of injury, okay? We're going to immobilize our patients, right? But not with our local protocols, we don't use backboards. We can place them uh, onto a backboard for extrication purposes then remove them from there uh, onto the stretcher itself, cervical collar in place. So high risk mechanism of injury strongly suggests the possibility of spinal injury and indicate that SMR, or spinal motion restriction, should be considered. So high velocity crashes greater than 40 miles an hour with severe vehicle damage. Unreseen occupant of a moderate to high speed motor vehicle crash. Vehicular damage with compartmental intrusion of 12 inches or more into the patient's seating space. Not into the compartment of the engine, but into where the patient actually sits, 12 inch intrusion. Um, fall from an adult from a height greater than 20 feet, fall from a child a height greater than 10 feet, or a, or a height two to three times a child's height, penetrating trauma near the spine, ejection from a moving vehicle, motorcycle crash greater than 20 miles an hour, auto pedestrian, auto bicycle crash greater than 20, 
miles per hour, death of an occupant in the same passenger compartment, rollover crash where the patient's unrestrained, um, diving, especially when it involves injury to the head or a witness who saw a deep dive in the shallow end of the water swimming pool, mechanisms of uncertain risk or spinal injury, which would be moderate to low velocity, which would be less than 40 miles an hour for motor vehicle crash, motor vehicle crash with uh, in which the patient is isolated with an isolated injury without positive assessment findings of spinal injury, isolated minor head injury without positive mechanism for spinal injury, syncopal event in which the patient was already seated or supine, syncopal event in which the patient was assisted to a supine position by a bystander, or some of the different ones there. So your primary survey would be a manual stabilization of the cervical spine in a neutral inline position. Identify level responsiveness. Remember utilizing your ABFU scale. Conduct a primary survey. Continue manual stabilization. Apply your cervical collar. Uh, check for life threatening hemorrhage. Must be treated before airway breathing concerns following the X A B C D E mnemonic. Evaluate and monitor the level of consciousness. So utilizing your, um, all right, Caitlin, no worries. I think I missed that from earlier, not just now. Um, looking at your alert oriented person, place, time, and event. Uh, unresponsive patients uh, with any trauma should be assumed to have a spinal injury. If they're unresponsive, they get a collar. Airway management, clear the mouth of suction if needed. Um, after opening the airway, be prepared to roll the patient onto one side to prevent aspiration, right? If you think that you're going to need airway management, then call for paramedic backup or flight um, to get someone there that can actually appropriately manage that airway. If you can't, if you don't think you can maintain it with just suction alone. So manual remove of debris uh, from patient's mouth is safe to do so. Suction, clear secretions, open the airway using the jaw thrust. A nasopharyngeal airway should not be used if basal skull fracture is suspected or if there is a nasal trauma. Be sure to monitor the patient closely and have him suction the unit readily available. Have it wrapped, prepped in, in, in a next to you on the action wall or if you have to bring it out to the scene with you depending on the scenario that you have. Ventilation with a head injury or spinal injury. Um, so evaluate the breathing, ensure that the adequate oxygenation and ventilation Right, so end title. Administer 100% oxygen by an under breather mask if the patient is breathing adequately. Ventilate the patient to maintain end title greater than 25. There are 35 to 45 is our normal. We want to be higher than 25, so if we need to ventilate, we ventilate the patient. Remember, we don't want vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Circulation and volume resuscitation, initiate CPR if needed. Uh, control any external bleeding with direct pressure or pressure dressings. Tourniquet the patients if they have external bleeding on an extremity. Um, volume resuscitation may be necessary, so we can utilize our two fluids, whether it be ringers or saline. IV therapy with boluses. Uh, assess radial pulses. Remember, if they don't have a radial, then they usually have a blood pressure of less than 90 based on PHTLS standards. Uh, evaluate skin color, temperature, and moisture. Assess for signs and symptoms of shock and treat appropriately. So an isolated closed head injury will not cause hypovolemic shock in an adult. So if signs of shock are present, carefully assess the patient for other injuries. Decide early whether to complete the secondary assessment on the scene or to transport the patient immediately with interventions en route. So look at your stability of that patient prior to transport. Do we need to go now or can we stay for two more minutes? Prompt transport to definitive care facility is crucial. So if available, consider air medical transport time if your transport time will be prolonged. It's usually more than an hour. Maintain patient or patent airway and provide high flow oxygen. In a supine patient, the head should be elevated 30 degrees. Offer psychological support to patients who are alert and aware of the, of the ability to move their limbs. So they may have a spinal cord injury and they can't move their limbs at all. They're gonna need some psychological support. History taking, looking at your OPQRSTI, right, any kind of interventions that were done before. If the patient is non-responsive, obtain a history from friends, family members, or medical identification jewelry. And obtain your sample history as well. On your secondary assessment, obtain vital signs. Remember, five minutes for every um, unstable patient, 15 for stable. 
In cases of high or intermediate risks, whenever possible, complete the physical exam with the patient in a neutral position. Apply manual stabilization when asked um, the patient not to move unless specifically asked to do so. Focus your physical examination on the site of injury, depending on the chief complaint. that time allows, do a secondary assessment route to the ED. <clears throat> Monitor patients for changes in level of consciousness and estimate the severity of increase in intracranial pressure. Again, monitor your ed pedal signs. Obtain baseline GCS score. Remember, eyes, verbal, and motor response. You guys should have those down and memorized. Eyes have one to four. Verbal response is one to five. Motor response is one to six. Expose your patient and examine the spine. While utilizing DCAP ETLS. And if there's an impairment, note the level of the impairment. For a spinal cord injury, it may also produce a pain independent from movement or palpation. So evaluate the chest and abdomen, auscultate and assess breath sounds. They reveal a shortened inspiratory phase, right? Is there potential for um, Cushing's as well? Or use mon and monitoring devices as well to, to maintain the patient. Continuously monitor the patient for signs of shock. So run your vital signs every five minutes. Examine for the gastrointestinal system may be unreliable. The presence of a neuro, neurological deficit. Remember, depending on where it's located, it could be a parasympathetic or sympathetic response. Um, so in men, assess the urethral medius and for priapism and look for any abnormal posturing and assess the blood glucose level as well. On your reassessment, uh, the vital signs should be monitored frequently. So be alert for hypotension without signs of shock. So a spinal cord injury may also be responsible for neuro, neurogenic shock also usually produces a flaccid paralysis um, and complete loss of sensation below the uh, level of injury. So document suspected SCIs, noting the area involved, sensation, motor function, and areas of weakness. As far as medical care for head trauma, the patient with a head injury according to four, is according to four principles when we treat them. Establish an adequate airway, control bleeding, and provide adequate circulation to maintain cerebral perfusion. Monitoring end title, the help of that. At least one 18 gauge intravenous access line administer isotonic crystalloid solutions as needed. We're going to assess baseline mental status and continuously monitor that, following local protocols, medical direction regarding hyperventilation in the presence of hyperperniation. Do not apply pressure to an open or depressed skull injury. In addition, assess and treat other injuries, address the wounds, uh, split any fractures, anticipate and uh, manage any kind of vomiting. Be prepared for seizures and change in patient condition and transport the patient promptly. So shock that develops in a patient with a TBI may be a result of hypovolemia. So establish 118 gauge line in normal saline or lactate ring or solution. Uh, only indication for administering glucose to a patient with a head injury is confirmed hypoglycemia, right? The last thing we want is to give somebody sugar that has a head bleed. Have uh, it get into the brain as necrotic as it is. The only indication for administering glucose for that. <coughs> if hypotension develops, infuse isotonic crystalloids as needed and do not allow the patient to become overheated. As far as scalp lacerations go, this can contribute to hypovolemia and any patient often indicated uh, indicate a deeper, more serious injury. So control bleeding by applying uh, drug pressure utilizing a dry sterile dressing and fold any avulsions back down onto the skin before applying pressure. So you'll flop the skin, put it back to where it needs to be. Do not apply excessive pressure to the open wound. Right? We don't want to put any excessive pressure on the head causing more damage if there's a bleed inside. If dressing becomes soaked, remove it and reevaluate the area where pressure was applied. As far as the mobilization of the cervical spine goes, stabilize the head and trunk so that potentially fractured bones and fragments do not cause any further damage. To perform manual inline stabilization, follow the steps in skill drill 30 1. I never force the head into a neutral position, inline position. Don't force it. If it's stuck in one spot and you can't move it any farther, don't snap it back into place. All right? Do not move the head any. Uh, Farther, if the patient reports muscle spasms in the neck, increased pain without, without, with movement, numbness, tingling, weakness in the arms or legs, 
or compromised airway or ventilation. All right, cervical collars provide preliminary um, partial support and should be applied to every patient who has a possible spinal injury or mechanism based on MOI history or signs and symptoms. All right, so assess um, CSMs in all extremities and maintain manual support until the patient has been fully secured to a backboard. Now, we are no longer doing that, but National Registry is still teaching backboard spinal restriction. All right. So keep that in mind for your testing purposes. So in your National Registry exam, they're going to ask you questions about spinal restriction. All right. The National Registry states you need to follow local protocol. All right. It does not mean that you do not spinal immobilize. That is not the correct answer. All right. There are several types of longboard mobilization devices out there. Um, you guys should all be familiar with this as, as well as well because you're already EMTs. These are what they call a Kendrick extrication device. These were initially designed for Indy Race, um, and they kind of made it out into the, the world for us to utilize. Um, I cannot tell you the last time I used one of these on a patient in a motor vehicle accident that involved for its per intended purpose as a spinal device. Okay. <laughs> I think I've used these more for pelvic fractures than anything else. But this replaces the short board. The other one would be a short board, and it's meant to get a patient out of a vehicle, and then you have to take this device, put it onto the backboard, releasing the crotch straps, which New Hampshire does not use them, by the way. They actually tell everybody to cut them off. Um, and the patient gets put onto a board and it's finally immobilized that way. That's the old school method. Um, New Hampshire, Maine. Massachusetts, we're not doing this anymore. So they are still required in the trucks though. They are still there, just in case you do need it for an extrication purpose only. Uh, for supine patients, um, the ideal procedure for that, for the patient is to utilize a backboard or a scoop stretcher. Um, what we want to do is slide the patient onto the back where he's a scoop stretcher underneath them, ensure the head, torso, and pelvis move as a unit. All right, so we want to move the neck to one side and have the pelvis not move with it. All right, so one, one move, one unit um, to keep everything in line and stable. As far as seated patients go, what they recommend is the use of a short board or a KED or Kendrick extirpation device or the vest style ext spinal extrication. Only use the devices to patients who are stable and not require rapid extrication. So if you are tested for this, TED short boards are only used for patients that are stable. You have time to get the patient out. Right? If it's a rapid extrication, get them out of the out of the car. Rapid extrication is indicated in case and only in cases of life or limb threatening injuries. Right? Helmets, um, questions to ask when treating a patient wearing a helmet. Is the patient's airway clear? Is the patient breathing adequately? Can you maintain airway and assist ventilation if the helmet remains in place? Can the face guard be easily removed to allow access to the airway without removing the helmet? How well does the helmet fit? Can the patient's head move within the helmet? Can the spine be immobilized in a neutral position with the helmet on? These are questions you want to make sure you're asking yourself. Right? And if you have a patient with a motor vehicle accident with a helmet, bring the helmet with you. Right, the helmet that fits well prevents the patient's head from moving and should be left on. If it's not a well fit helmet, then the helmet needs to be removed. Right, there are specific conditions when the helmet gets removed. So, here are the conditions right here one is it a full face helmet, two, it makes it assessing or managing the airway problems difficult. Removal and removal of the face guard to improve airway access is not possible. Three, it prevents possible or sorry, prevents proper immobilization of the spine. Number four, if it allows excessive head movement. Or five, the patient's in cardiac arrest. Sports helmets are typically worn in the front and may or may not include an attached face mask. Right, so the sports teams. Um, should have athletic trainers that have the ability to get these face pieces off. All right. If not, hopefully you guys are carrying screwdrivers on your ambulance. 
uh, to be able to remove these if you have sports teams in within your response district. But the helmet will stay in place and we'll just remove the face piece. As far as motorcycle helmets, often have a shield covering the face. The shield cannot be removed and the helmet, ha the helmet has to come off. Preferred method of removing the helmet is at least, choose it's at least a two person job depending on the actual type of helmet that's actually there. So if you have any questions, you can always consult medical control. Alternate methods, as you can see here, um, allows the helmet to be removed with applications of less force. Uh, slightly more time consuming revolves removing the chin strap and the face mask. They actually do make a device. Um, I'm not sure, is anybody else that you guys have seen these before? London, you may have seen this before too. Um, there's a device that they have that's like a BP cuff almost, so they can slide into the helmet. What they do is they, and they increase it, they inflate it, and it actually pops the helmet off. Yeah, yeah, we um, I, I, we, we have it here. We, we only have one because they're, they're so expensive and uh, you rarely use them. But yeah, literally, it it's made to basically basically form a mold of it. So once you slide it in there, uh, so that the face pieces that we have now come off, they're actually a clip system just for that. But uh, once you slide it in there, um, there's two different sides you can hit it from and you literally use like a squeeze pump and it literally just takes the the shape of the head and it actually almost uh, looks like a, literally like a, a, a air helmet basically. Yep. And the helmets nowadays too for sports teams as well, uh, football and whatnot, they're more, they're better designed now for um, like concussion prevention. If I'm saying that correctly, I know there's a lot more design into it. They have air helmets as well. I, when I played, you could fill them up with air as well. It was pretty interesting stuff. And that was 20 plus years ago. So a lot of different things are out there. Um, if you do happen to have a football team or high school team in the area that you respond to, during one of your shifts, take a ride over and say, listen, I take a look at your helmets. You get familiar with the newer technology that's out there. Um, we do not carry those on any of ours. I'm not sure how many ambulance services do carry those helmet removal stuff. But a lot of times these athletic trainers will actually have those with them. They'll have one, like London was saying, is that they have one usually because they're expensive, but they can easily remove a helmet if need be. Unless the patient's critical, then it has to come off. But if you have time, it's one way to do it. All right. So smaller airways are proportionally large with proportionally larger heads. Obviously, we talk about our pediatrics. Uh, padding may be needed to maintain airway. Pad underneath the shoulders, the toes is needed. Um, around it is needed in place blanket rolls. So as you can see, looking on the board here, they have padded everywhere to make it so the, the child could not move. Um, we haven't done this in a very long time, but it's still, it's still a skill that has to be reviewed. Um, as far as blanket rolling and packaging patients. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a pediatric. It could be a shorter person on, a, on a, an adult. You still wanna make sure that you can pack those voids in the areas, make sure they don't slide and move around. Um, they do make pediatric backboards as well, um, which are actually pretty interesting things, but they're also fairly expensive. So not a lot of services actually carry true PD boards. Um, Non-traumatic spinal conditions, uh, is back pain being one of the most common physical ailments. Upright posture places a substantial amount of weight on the patient lumbar spine. So most patients are susceptible to injury or degenerative diseases. Spinal tumors can also cause pain and uh, debilitation. So most cases, lower back pain or idiopathic. So, maybe, okay. so pay special attention to the patient's medications that they're currently taking. Um, I am not me, I'll tell you my personal opinion. I am not really big on giving narcotics to patients with back pain. If I can treat it with something like Toradol first, or I like for, for mains protocols, be like IV acetaminophen um, coming into the A, hopefully A level uh, in New Hampshire here soon too. So, but PO Tylenol or Motrin for inflammation reduction can also be a benefit as well. All right, and the last, but. Uh, so older adults and patients with history of osteoporosis are at high risk for spontaneous compression factors. Uh, so there may be times where they actually do need paramedic level care for pain management. Uh, tumors in the spine can cause a pathologic spine fracture as well. Degenerative disc disease is quite common. 
Uh, disc herniation may be caused by some degree of trauma as well. So pre-hospital management of lower back pain in the absence of trauma is primarily palliative. It's getting them to a hospital. So look at their medication. Let's kind of see what's been going on. Some of the most common areas that occur would be the L4, L5, L5S1, but also C5, C6, C6, C7 injuries as well. All right, I'm gonna stop this here. This conference will now be recorded. All right, so let's talk about chest injuries, chapter 31. All right. So thoracic injuries, they're very common and potentially very serious. Remember that our thoracic cavity, thoracic cage covers like all of our vital organs, right? Thinking of the heart, the lungs, um, moving our way down. A lot of protection is there. Right, so the potential for very serious uh, traumatic injuries uh, as well. So injuries are not in, uh, interfering with normal breathing must be treated without delay, right? So we have any kind of rib cage injuries to just anything in that thoracic region. Blood vessels from lacerations or thoracic organs or major blood vessels can also collect in the chest cavity as well. Air can collect in the chest as, um, as well and prevent the lungs from expanding, right? So we can have pneumothorax, hemothorax, tension pneumothorax, a hemo pneumo, get both um, to uh, pericardial tamponade with pressure against the heart, right? As well as fluid buildup. So there's a lot of stuff that can be happening going on from traumatic injuries in that thoracic cavity that we have to make sure that we can recognize in the field and start getting treatment for these patients right away. <clears throat> so prevention strategies, obviously gun safety education, sports training, use of seatbelts, the proper use of seatbelts, which account for a substantial number of injuries and fatalities each year. One of four traumatic deaths is the direct result of a thoracic injury. Motor vehicle crashes account for the majority of patients with blunt thoracic trauma. So a little AMP review really quick. Um, thoracic cavity extends from the lower of the end of the neck to the diaphragm. Okay, lower end of the neck down here to the diaphragm, which is right here. This is your thoracic cavity, right? So in there, you would find the mediastinum uh, where the central region of the thorax that contains the heart, the great vessels, the esophagus, lymphatic channels, trachea, mainstream bronchi, and paired vagus and phrenic nerves. So the contents of the thoracic, or actually the thorax, are partially protected by the ribs, right? So our ribs do a pretty decent job protecting that thoracic cavity. Um, connected into the back to 12 thoracic vertebrae, right? So connected to the front through the costal cartilage in the sternum, as you can see here. So posterior anterior, the ribs. You have the costal cartilages here. They connect into the ribs, the wrap around into T1 through T12, right? So your scapula is doing a good job here protecting as well. Heart, lungs, pleura, diaphragm here. So this would be our thoracic cavity that we're trying to protect. So the muscles of the thorax help protect underlying organs. They provide necessary movement for breathing, like the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm are primary muscles. The sternocleidomastoid muscle are accessory muscles that are utilized. Trapezius, rhomboids, um, latissimus, dorsi muscles provide covering for the framework of the posterior thorax. The pectoralis major surrounds the rib cage in the front, so the pectorals, right? So the trachea is in the middle of the neck, which divides at the crina into the right and left mesem bronchi. The lungs then occupy the entire thoracic cavity except the mediastinum. So the esophagus enters the thorax via the thoracic inlet and travels through the posterior of the chest, <clears throat> excuse me, which connects the pharynx superiorly with the stomach and the abdomen. 
The diaphragm then forms the inferior border of the thoracic cavity and the superior border of the abdominal cavity. So nerves supplying the diaphragm or the phrenic nerves exit the spinal cord at C3, C4, and C5. So as you can see, C5, C6 on here. So paralysis of all muscles below the shoulders, if we have a fracture up there, breathing by diaphragm only, and loss of sensation from the shoulders down. C3, C4, C5, keep the body alive. Remember that, right? That's why it's so important that we um, look at that as well. Mike, maybe nervous by saying hit record. I went back and looked at it. All right. <laughs> so ventilations occur through expansion and contraction of the thoracic cage. Um, so intercostal muscles between the ribs contract, but the diaphragm then contracts and descends when inspiration is an active process and expiration is a passive process. So if you all take a deep breath in, that's an active process. As you expel, 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 expel the air coming back out again, that's a passive process where our muscles relax. Okay, so exhalation is the intercostal muscles and diaphragm relaxing, the tissues move back into their normal positions. Why am I changing slides? Let's try it again. There we go. So while the pulmonary respiration is occurring, blood is being delivered via the pulmonary circulation to the capillaries that lie adjacent to the alveoli. Oxygenation, delivery of the oxygen, or O2, from the air to the blood. So the ability to pump blood depends on the functional pump, which is the heart, the adequate volume of blood being pumped, right? Make sure we're not hypovolemic, and the lack of resistance of pumping mechanism. The afterload. So is our heart pumping effectively, right? So we can have deviations to that. What are some things that could deviate that process from happening in trauma? What are some things? All right, I got tamponade. Right, and how do we tell cardiac tamponade again? What well, three things do we look for for cardiac tamponade? Muffled heart sounds is one. JVD, number two. Who else wants to jump in? Mike Hunter, narrowed blood pressure. I love it. Narrowing pulse pressures. And what kind of what triad is this called again? Thanks. It is. Perfect. Good job. All right. So cardiac output, volume of blood delivered to the body in one minute. Cardiac output. Ventilation is the exchange of air between the lungs and the environment. Right? So perfusion and ventilation works hand in hand along with oxygenation, right? So again, I keep bringing this up all the time, antenna monitoring, pulse oximetry. Chemical changes influence the rate and depth of breathing, right? Chemical change as being like your pH changing. Chemoreceptors are sensors that re respond to chemical fluctuations and are located in two major body locations. So respiratory alkalosis results from hyperventilation. We're breathing too fast, we become very alkalotic as you can see looking at the scales here. Carbonic acid lost by hyperventilation. For HCO3, our bicarb starts to drop. Or increase, I should say not drop, increase, I'm bringing it on the wrong side. <clears throat> so our goal, so increases, increased levels of carbon dioxide are mediated mainly through influence on the central chemoreceptors of the brainstem. Respiratory alkalosis results from the hyperventilation, as you can see here. All right, bicarbonate loss by renal excretion. Bicarbonate reduces, our pH range starts to go back into normal range. Right, as our bicarb increases, right, looking at the metabolic side of things, 
our end title or our respiratory alkali H2CO3, our carbonic acid, loss through hyperventilation causes us to become more alkalotic, right? Alkalosis. Respiratory acidosis is related to the body's inability to remove carbon dioxide. Respiratory acidosis you know, um, is the inability of removing that. So if you look at our ranges here, our normal range, 7.35, 7.45, right? Additional Right, so looking at this here, formation of additional bicarbonates, kind of maintaining that homeostasis, keeping our pH range normal. And additional carbon or carbonic acid retaining, um, owning to impaired pulmonary function, right? So if we are breathing too slow and we are retaining carbonic acid, we're gonna become acidotic, right? Our pH is gonna start going lower. So how do we fix this? How do we fix this in the field? How do we fix this in the field though? Yeah. Ponder great, positive pressure, ventilating a patient. Yeah, breathing for them, right? Controlling that breath, hypo or hyperventilating, controlling that breathing rate will help us fix that pH scale, will help us fix that. And we have to monitor that through end tidal CO2, right? So it's, that's why I keep bringing that up all the time, it's one of those things, but it's amazing what we can measure just on carbon dioxide readings, right? So that's what we look for. Um, is is that specific right so changes in arterial ph can modify respiratory rate and depth so ventilations occur in response to p changes in ph detected by the peripheral chemoreceptors so in metabolic acid alkalosis the respiratory rate and depth decreased in an attempt to retain carbon dioxide to lower those ph levels okay Go back. Are there any questions at all in regards to the physiology review? We, I know we covered this in pathophys, but it's a good review to kind of go over. You guys feel okay with this? All right. We can fix a lot of this in the field, remember. Okay. We can fix a lot of this just by doing positive pressure ventilation and, and monitoring end tidal. All right. Everybody else good? I see Matt says he's fine. You good? I don't want to skip too far ahead. I'm all of this. set. All set? Okay. All right. So, with pathophysiology, there are two categories of mechanism of injury and thoracic trauma that's blunt and penetrating. The two categories of chest injuries are open and closed. Closed would be a force um, which is uh, distributed over a large area where visceral injuries occur from deceleration, shearing forces, compression, or rupture. As you can see here, this is not an open, but a significant um, bruising place. And what do you think maybe have caused this injury that you see here for a deceleration injury? Yeah, seatbelt, good. So penetrating injuries dispute or distribute forces over a smaller area as we have a puncture. As you can see here, the punctured lung. With significant bleeding. These would be our open fractures or open injuries. Blunt trauma or rib fractures, sternum or whole areas of the chest wall or blunt force trauma, bruised lungs or heart, damaged aorta, skin or chest wall that are not penetrated, broken ribs that may lacerate the endothoracic organs or vital organs can be torn from their attachment in the chest cavity without any break in the skin. This is our blunt force trauma, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, um, falls from great heights. These things can cause this blunt force trauma to have these types of injury patterns start, right? So just because we can't see it doesn't mean there isn't something there. So we have to actually palpate, auscultate, look at vital signs, 
right? Look at referred pains and different injuries. And then look at our mechanism of injury and say, if this patient fell this far, we should suspect to see these specific injuries that are there. Um, blast injuries or a shock wave during a primary blast compresses the organs, similar to a blunt trauma. So during the secondary phase of the blast, objects may be thrown, then penetrate the body. So for the blast injury, you could have both open and closed injuries, right? Shock waves and then <clears throat> shrapnel coming at you the second time. Injuries to the chest um, have the potential to be lethal. Blood loss, pressure changes, vital organ damage, or just a combination of all of them. So increased chances of hypovolemia and hypoxia. Decreased lung volume and oxygenation impair the heart's ability to pump effectively. Where blood in the pericardial sac compresses the heart, eventually stopping it altogether. Myocardial valve damage can disrupt ventricular filling, vascular disruption. Right, some things to think about. Some impairments to the ventilor, ventilatory efficiency may be rapidly fatal. So decreased air exchange and oxygenation, reduced minute volume, a pneumothorax, hemothorax, so collapsed lung, um, hemothorax being blood in the lungs, or decreased tidal volume. Analeptosis. Or alveolar collapse, preventing, from the, uh, preventing use from a portion of the lung for ventilation and oxygenation. Significantly reduces the surface area available for gas exchange. Therefore, we're going to have lower gas exchange. Uh, end tidal may be changing. We're not going to have as much oxygen getting into the system. So bruised lung tissue may produce marked hypoxemia. All right, so disruption of respiratory tract prevents oxygen from reaching the alveoli. All right, so look for any kind of respiratory tract injuries as well. Signs and symptoms of chest injuries would be pain at the site of the injury, pain lies at the site of the injury aggravated by or increased with breathing, bruising to the chest wall, crepitus with palpita uh, palpation on the chest, penetrating injury to the chest, dyspnea, um, vomiting of blood, um, failure of the chest to expand normally with inspiration, Rapid weak pulses and low blood pressures, cyanosis around the lips and fingernail beds. So a lot of these will be more of your signs and symptoms that you would see. Any change in breathing uh, also is an important sign. So fewer than 12 breaths a minute or more than 20 breaths per minute may indicate inadequate breathing. Remember, 12 to 20 is our normal range for an adult. Patients often have tachypnea or shallow respirations, and patients may also present with uh, lower respirations and labor respirations as well. So we need to make sure we're doing a full assessment. Don't just take a guess. A lot of times I've seen this before for providers just guess on respirations, right? We need to get an adequate count. We truly need to measure the respiratory rate, okay? Because that can indicate a lot of different, different issues as well. All right, so get that rate and take a look, All right? Is it shallow? Remember, it's rate, rhythm, and quality. So listen to the lung sounds, right? Look for adequate rise and fall, good volume as well when you do your assessment. So dyspnea, obviously causes would be airway obstruction, Damage to the chest wall, improper, uh, improper chest expansion, lung compression, hemoptysis or vomiting of blood, lung. Um, <clears throat> so again, blood may enter the bronchial passages as well. One second. So presence or absence of a pulse uh, varies according to the nature and extent of injury. Rapid weak pulses and hypotension are principal signs of hypovolemic shock. So absent radial pulses may indicate severe hypotension, so then check for a carotid. Uh, bradycardia or tachycardia may also indicate compensatory shock as well, or compensated shock or hypoxemia. 
and bradycardia is generally an ominous sign of this, right? We want to make sure that we catch this in the tachycardia range if they are in shock, right? Because then once they start getting into the bradys, we're looking more at the decompensated part of it. So we want to make sure we catch that around. So changes in blood pressure obviously vary with the nature and extent of injury. Hypertension may also be the result of an increased sympathetic discharge. Hypotension is also a sign of hypovolemia, relative hypovolemia or late shock. Narrowed pulse pressures may indicate increased pressure on the myocardium. We already talked about those, right, with, the, with Beck's triad. And loss of peripheral pulses during inspiration suggests a um, pulses paradoxus or a cardiac tamponade. So the patient may also have hypothermia from a neurogenic shock due to spinal cord injury as well. So diaphoresis and pallor accompany peripheral vasoconstriction. So cyanosis is a sign of inadequate respiration. So many signs and symptoms occur simultaneously. Signs resulting from chest injury require prompt transport and aggressive treatment. So as far as scene size up goes, ensure scene safety, number of patients, appropriate protection, protective equipment, triage if needed, request resources, consider, consider, <laughs> consider the need for spinal immobilization. On our primary survey, again, form a general impression, are they sick or are they not sick as we walk in? How does it appear to you? Your general impression. Difficulty speaking can indicate several problems, right? So that one word, two word dyspnea, how many words can I get in before their next breath? Right, track that. That is going to be part of your assessment as you walk through the door in your general impression. Skin color, skin, you know, is it pale, diaphoretic, gray, ashen, you know, pink, warm, right? Looking at all that kind of stuff. Report your perform a rapid exam for obvious injuries. If you see an obvious injury or a major bleeding, stop it, right? Appearance of blood as well. Difficulty breathing, cyanosis, irregular breathing, asymmetrical chest rise, right? If one side of the chest is going up, the other side is not. That could be a problem, right? It could be an indication of a pneumothorax. Accessory muscles in the neck while breathing, right? The sternocleidomastoid muscle or accessory muscle, extended or engorged external jugular veins, right? We talked about JVD. If we see it, what are we suspecting in trauma? Right? If we see JVD, we suspect potential for what? Because we just talked about this. Right, tamponade, exactly. So, Matt, I think you're thinking more of tracheal deviation with that for pneumo. Yeah, I knew you meant. So, if obvious, pro if no obvious problems, then if I any life threats that are there, do your assessment. You have to touch and expose your patient to see what's going on. Protect the spine early and assess for spinal injuries. Examine the neck for penetrating wounds and position of the trachea itself. Again, trachea is deviated. Remember, that's a very late sign of a pneumothorax. Remember whether the whether breathing um, is present or adequate, inadequate. Rate, rhythm, and quality. Right. This is why I keep gowns on stretchers. Right, Mr. Harrington. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm here. I know you're here. Uh, this is why I keep gowns on stretchers because we need to expose our patients to assess them, right? Let me just cover them back up after, right? It makes life a lot easier, right? Expose, expose, expose. You've got to look at your patients. All right. Now let's see. Where was I? There we go. So inspect for decap BTLS. So really quickly, someone tell me what decap BTLS is again, just so I can make sure we're all paying attention. Who wants to take a stab at this one? Deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swellings. Damn, I'm good. 
Dave, you are good. Love it. All right. Look for retractions, puncture wounds, penetrating injury, suggest an open chest injury. Be alert for associated burns as well. Um, absent or decreased breath sounds on one side usually indicate significant damage to a lung. Check for that paradoxal motion. All right. Why would we really, why are we concerned about chest wall burns? Other than infection. It could compromise respiratory, right? Uh, well, the lungs, I should say. Absolutely. So what happens when your skin is burned? It, it kind of constricts, right? Making it very tight to breathe. Yes. Yeah. Not allowing for full chest wall expansion. All right. So immediately cover any open wounds with your gloved hand and apply an occlusive dressing to all penetrating chest injuries. Why are we putting occlusive dressings on these patients? What are we trying to prevent from happening? Uh, a pneumo, right? Preventing well, air from... What was that, Matt? Flail chest segment. Well, we're looking for flail chest, two or more broken ribs in one area. But if we have a puncture, okay, directly through into the lung, you have an open chest wall injury, right? You put an occlusive dressing on. To keep it from becoming a pneumothorax, right? Right. Yeah, keeping it, like Mike, like Mike said, keeping it solid. Isn't right. it supposed to also prevent air from getting into the pleural space? Absolutely, 100% correct. That's what we want to do is make sure we prevent air from coming in, right? We want to make sure that air comes out, but when you take that breath back in, it sucks against that occlusive dressing, right? So applying an occlusive dressing is a critical skill, critical find, critical assessment, critical skill, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like splinting somebody. But not, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, uh, tourniqueting somebody, right? It has to be done. We do not want air entering that chest wall. We want to expand, not going back in again. So occlusive dressing, right? So make sure you know where those occlusive dressings are located on your ambulance. They should be in your first in bag for trauma. Right, at least one. Right, identify any changes in patient's mental status. Trauma patients with chest injuries can change mental status quickly. Hypovolemia, hypoxemia, all those things. Assessing for a pulse, control external bleeding with direct pressure and apply a bulky dressing. If it's on an extremity, we're gonna tourniquet and move forward. Right, significant bleeds, we can put in um, hemostatic agents like quick clot. Auscultate heart sounds. Listen to the heart. Make sure you hear S1, S2 sounds. Make sure it's maybe make sure it's getting, you're getting the lub dub correct. Muffled heart tones is an important diagnostic clue, for, right? For pericardial tamponade. Hypersonance. It's a panic drum like sound that generally indicates the presence of air. All right. Or hyporesonance, which is a dull sound that generally indicates solid or fluid rather than air. So if you're listening and you do a thud sound, you tap your finger and you hear thud, thud, or it should be a hollow sound, right? Should be hypersonic, sonance, not hypo. Uh, note the presence of the scaphoid abdomen as well. Trigular vein distension su suggests increased in intravenous pressure. So a lack of JVD in the supine position in combination with other physical findings suggests a hypovolemic state. Right, people that are laying down flat, if you are in decent shape and don't have a lot of fat building up around your neck, you should be able to see JVD. That's okay. Now, if I see it when you're sitting up, now I've got a problem, right? Manage any immediate life threats, threatening conditions. If we need to bolus a patient, we need to bolus a patient. Give them the fluids. History taking, investigate the chief complaint, a mechanism of injury by obtaining a history of the present illness. Inquire about dyspnea, chest pain, associated symptoms, history of cardiorespiratory disease, use of a restraint in motor vehicle accident, any medications the patient may be taking. If a patient is, um, let me rephrase this question, I'm gonna the answers here. What medications would change the signs and symptoms of a patient in shock? 
Give me one medication that would change it. Beta blockers. Does everybody else agree? Agreed. Agreed. I like that. It's a good answer. Beta blockers. Absolutely. That's why it's so important to make sure you guys understand what medications are on. I know that not a lot of people get the full medication list before they start transporting, but that's very important, especially with a trauma patient, because if they're on beta blockers and it blocks that sign and symptom of tachycardia, which is one of our initial signs of hypovolemia or shock or a compensated shock, I should say, right? So any OLOLs, right? Beta blockers as a whole, right? So those will reduce heart rates to the point where we're not going to see that tachycardia, right? So be careful with that. Look at the patient's medication list as you're treating the patient. Sample actually does mean something, and we all know what it means, obviously, but it actually means to truly get your medications, right? Look at them, right? Investigate associated signs and symptoms and pertinent negatives. Pertinent negatives would be no associated shortness of breath, no rapid breathing, no absence or abnormal breath sounds, no areas of deformity or abnormal movement, no chest pain, no nausea, no dizziness. Those are pertinent negative um, answers, okay? So if I said to any of you guys, do you have any shortness of breath? You tell me no, per pertinent negatives. Put that in your narrative as well, document. Getting your sample history, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, pertinent to past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading to the illness or injury. Identify these events leading to the emergency. What happened? Why are we here? What made you call 911? Why are we here at this point in time? Right? Secondary assessment look for injuries and for the potential for compromise and management of ABCs. Um, in cases of isolated injury, focus your assessment on the isolated injury, the patient's complaint, and the body region affected. Uh, with significant trauma, you should quickly assess the entire patient from head to toe. You have to look at that rapid trauma assessment head to toe, right? Looking at the head, ears, eyes, nose, throat, chest, equal rise and fall, lung sounds, palpate the quick ribs, assess the abdomen, all four quadrants through the pelvis, right? Looking at each extremity from femur down to the to the feet, checking the CSMs, checking the spinal the spinal cord as you roll the patient all the way down to the buttocks. Right? Do that full assessment, check the CSMs, find the problems, fix the problems as best you possibly can. Right? Femur fractures, pelvic fractures, um, major bleeds, chest wall trauma, um, penetrating trauma to the chest. Those are significant findings that need immediate intervention. Right? A fractured ankle is not an immediate intervention. That can stay fractured until your secondary assessment you can go back and fix your secondary injuries, right? Look for ecchymosis and other evidence of trauma while assessing the skin. Repeat the rapid full body assessment looking for DCAP, ETLS. Obtain vital signs. You have to get vital signs quickly, right? That way we can start looking at our trends. Use other monitoring devices we have available. End title. Trauma patients need to be have end title monitoring. Pulse oximetry, okay? And if you have the ability, and your monitors have the ability for this, continuous temperature monitoring, right? Most of the ones that we carry, where I work, have the ability without the probes, right? I actually went out and bought my own probe for it. I do carry that with me if needed. So again, continuous temperature monitoring works as well. Remember, patients can become hypothermic in, neuro, in, a, in a neurogenic shock. Reassess the patient's vital signs, oxygenation, circulatory state, and breath sounds. Why do we keep reassessing breath sounds all the time? Why do we have to reassess them more than once? Okay, fluid saturation, um, monitor for changes, fluids. Or how about the fact that we can still have a pneumothorax and not pick up on it in the first set of lung sounds, right? I've taken so many patients to the hospital that had a pneumothorax that I did not pick up on in the field because the leak was so small that it got picked up on in a chest x-ray, right? 
So reassessment, reassessment, reassessment. Check the lungs. If you suspect that there should be a pneumothorax of this injury, then it's reassess it because that could change quickly during transport. All right. Um, stabilizing ABCs is primary management concern. All right. So evaluate the airway respiratory status while maintaining cervical immobilization. Be prepared to suction the patient. Have it ready next to you, right, in the back of the ambulance. All right. If you don't touch it, you don't use it, you can put it back. At least have it out, ready to go. All right. Administer high flow oxygen if significant bleeding is suspected. All right. We don't want to start pushing free radicals everywhere. All right. Treat the patient. How are they presenting? What do they need? If needed, provide assisted ventilations using a BVM with a high flow oxygen as well. All right. If that's the case, then put a end tidal monitoring device on your BVM as well. All right. You can leave them both on nasal cannula and, and um, the one for the BVM. Doesn't matter. All right. Just pick one that you're going to hook into your system. That's all. If needed, provide assisted ventilations. Avoid increased in, increasing the patient's work of breathing and pain. Right. Treat for shock and provide rapid transport if the patient has signs of hypoperfusion. Call for paramedics so they can provide pain management. Establish at least one bore, one large bore IV catheter to administer a 20 ml per kilo bolus of an isotonic crystalloid solution. Titrate the fluid administration to maintain a systolic blood pressure of 80 to 90 and follow the local protocols and call for paramedic support. So, let me ask you this. Who wants to take a stab at it? You've got a patient that weighs 240 pounds. How much fluid do you need to give the patient? Patient weighs 240 pounds. How much fluid are they going to receive? Based on a 20 ml per kilo. An adult really should be getting 30, not 20. 20 is more for the pediatrics. Two hundred and forty pounds. How much fluid will they gonna receive as a bolus based on twenty mLs per kilo? Three hundred and twenty-four mLs. Right. That's not three twenty-four. So two hundred and forty pounds. And the patient in the in the fluid administration is twenty mLs per kilogram. I see Justin put his reply up. What do you guys think? I know it's math and it's 8.30 at night. It's okay though. You guys agree with Justin's? It was 240 pounds, and how many, what per gig? 20 mLs per kilo. So I see Michael put his up. Uh, Mike Hunter agrees with uh, all that. Two and a half, uh, two and a half liter, uh, two, we'll say two liters in a 250 bag if we round it. No, oh, I like it. Okay, so pretty close. So the exact the exact number is two thousand one hundred eighty one point eight one eight one eight one eight mLs, right? So we can <laughs> a shit ton exactly. So what we can really do is say they're going to get uh, twenty two hundred mLs of fluid, right? Now keep in mind that the normal and looking at protocols as well, adult patients get thirty mLs per kilo. A child gets pediatrics. 
get 20 mLs per kilo. Neonates get 10 mLs per kilo, okay? So keep that in mind for fluid administration. So if you have a 10 pound neonate, okay? And they're getting 10 mLs per kilo, what are you guys gonna be giving? Do the last one, and then I'll stop with the med bath for, for a little bit. 10 mLs right. per kilo, and what was a pound? Yeah. 10 pound baby. Yeah. Receiving 10 mLs per kilo. Four fifty ish. Not four fifty. Ten pounds divided by two point two. Sorry, forty-five. Yeah, I was gonna give. Yeah. yeah, forty-five mLs. That's your bolus. That's it. So ten divided by two point two is four point five times um, ten would be forty-five mLs. Right. That's not a lot of fluid. That's four and a half flushes. You're breaking it down. Right. So keep that stuff in mind how important it is to do that. Now, on patients expelling fluid, this is kind of off topic, but good to know about. Right. If they have a Foley catheter in place, they should be putting out an average of 30 mLs an hour. Okay. 30 mLs an hour. Um, so, all right. Enough of math for the night. Now it's 8.30. So pathophysiology assessment and management of specific emergency rib fractures are infrequent in children because obviously the palatability of the thoracic cage. They mostly occur in older patients with bones that may vary, may, may be very brittle. So upper four ribs, well protected by the clavicle and scapula fractures is a sign of a very significant MOI because they're well protected. Um, Morbidity and mortality increases with age, number of fractures, and location of where the fractures are. A fracture rib may lacerate the surface of the lung as well. So you may have subcutaneous emphysema or the rice crispy feeling or crackly feeling um, to the skin in the area that it's at. Right? Indicates an air escaping in, from the laceration, or lacerated lung is leaking in the subcutaneous layer of the chest wall. These patients here, and I'm getting a de decompression. Call for paramedics for this. They'll we'll probably be getting a chest tube as well. Uh, ribs through the four through nine are most often fractured. Patient uses um, an arm to split the injury. That shallow respirations to decrease chest movement and pain. Right. So shallow respirations, long term. So patient fell, broke their ribs, didn't want to go to the hospital. Okay. They call you two weeks later with difficulty breathing. What do you suspect the problem could be? What are your suspicions for that? <clears throat> Patient with a fracture, lung, and I'll, I'll go more into this. Lung sounds are still clear. Um, their pulse oximetry reading is dropping a little bit. And you're starting to hear some fluid build up on the side of the fracture. I like Matt O'Connor's answer is pneumonia, right? So pneumonia would be the correct answer for that as well. So multiple fluid fractures can lead to atelectasis, hypoventilation, inadequate cough, and pneumonia. So we're, we're so stuck, and, and we're, we're talking through this here, embolus. We're thinking all of these indications based on trauma, when all reality, it was the medical condition, right? So we cannot rule out medical conditions based upon just trauma, because that can lead into medical, cause and effect of what's actually happening, right? So we look at that as well. Um, so atelectasis decreases the surface area for gas exchange, obviously severe trauma, uh, to first and second ribs may result in a ruptured aorta, okay, um, as well as a tracheobronchial tree injury or a vascular injury. The lower rib or left lower rib trauma may contribute to a splenic injury, right? So if we have a splenic injury, where would the referred pain be to? Or is there any referred pain? 
okay? So the shoulder, right? So we have inadequate coughs as well, as, with the, as well as pneumonia. On the right lower rib, trauma may cause liver injury as well. So we look at all those different patterns. So understand your anatomy and physiology. Understand the structure, the bone structural area as well when we're assessing these patients. If I have fractures here, this could potentially be this if it's not stabilized. And then paint that picture. A lot of times you'll have patients with rib fractures, you'll end up getting a patient refusal because they don't want to go because they're not well educated on the potential injury pattern that could actually happen. So having that extra knowledge, consulting with medical control at your level, at the A level, have that conversation and convince that patient to go to be treated. Okay. And maybe as simple as just getting pain management. So with posterior fracture, the fifth through ninth ribs are most frequently injured, right? So look at the floating ribs as well, um, which are well protected and rarely fractured. The injury suggests a severe MOI and a strong potential for other life-threatening injuries. With rib fractures, it puts the patient at risk for multiple injuries, right? It's not just the ribs, also the underlying effect. Patients with fractured ribs will report localized tenderness and pain on breathing, which is why they start breathing shallow, which then turns into pneumonia. Managing rib fractures focuses on maintaining the ABCs and evaluating the patient for other injuries. Flail chest is a segment of the chest wall that may be detached from the rest of the thoracic cage, uh, producing a free-floating segment caused by a motor vehicle crash. Um, what else? Falls from the significant heights, industrial accidents, um, assaults as well. Uh, so significant chest trauma is also required, um, is required to cause a flail chest. So mortality increases with advanced age. Um, seven or more broken ribs, three or more associated injuries, shock, head injuries as well, and does not allow for adequate oxygenation. So we have to make sure we're assessing these patients. And once again, I go back to put the patient on the end title, put the patient on pulse oximetry, and look at our signs and symptoms that we currently have and oxygenate the patient that needs to be oxygenated. Now, I know I talk a lot about end title. Um, we're going to cover that in detail um, towards the end of the program where we have some of our makeup days, right? I do have a capnography program that I'm going to go over with you guys um, and, and, and learn how to read the capno waves that are actually there that you're looking at. Respiratory failure in a patient with a flail chest generally results from other associated injuries like a pulmonary contusion, a new more hemothorax as well. Um, expose and examine the chest for decap BTLS. Okay, look at the chest. Uh, managing it to assess the need for positive pressure ventilation and then administer oxygen. So using positive pressure ventilation if ventilations are inadequate, right? Not every patient requires a BVM. And right? let's talk real world. Not every patient requires an honorary breather, right? Make sure that the patients are receiving what they need to receive based on presentation. Hold on one second. All right, so sternal fractures are a blow significant enough to fracture a sternum causes severe hyperflexion of the thoracic cage. So the isolated sternal fracture has a mortality rate that raises or rises with additional injuries as people age. This may result in pulmonary or myocardial contusions, flail chests, and other injuries. So expect to find localized pain and tenderness over the sternum along with crepitus on palpation. Again, we have to expose our patients. So tachypnea is also very common. So we want to maintain good respiratory status and monitor for respiratory cardiovascular changes. Right? Do not overly aggressive do not overly aggressively ventilate patients that further exacerbate the injuries. So establish IV access, but provide fluid sparingly. Right? 
enough to keep the vein open, but not flooding the patient with fluids. Right? We want to administer an isotonic crystalline solution to maintain a systolic blood pressure of 80 to 90 and evaluate, uh, sorry, evaluate elevate the head um, of the back of the long board if you have one on to help reduce pressure in the thoracic cavity and facilitate lung expansion. Now, with our current protocols, let's go to New Hampshire for a minute. They do not have to be on a long board. So if they're off of it, we can we can sit them up a little ways, put them at a 30 degree angle. Okay. Or would we go any higher than that? Uh Conchio cortis. That's when the thoracic receives a direct blow. Um, during a critical portion of the heart's repolarization phase, leading to immediate cardiac arrest. Almost like that RNT phenomenon they talk about. So um, this usually happens in sports events like a baseball to the chest, and then they drop into cardiac arrest. So the patient may present with ventricular fibrillation that responds positively to early defibrillation if provided within three minutes. Survival rates depend on the public awareness, CPR, AED access, and protective gear that they're currently wearing. Right. I've seen I've never I've never seen this before, but I've read stories or seen it um, in different um, studies that I've watched where they take like a baseball, to, like a line drive to the chest patient drops that hits that depolarize or sorry, repolarizing phase, um, causing the patient to go into VTAC or sorry, VFib and right in the cardiac arrest. Uh, simple pneumothorax is where air enters the lung through a hole in the chest wall or the surface of the lung as the patient attempts to breathe. The pressure builds up in the portal space. Most low velocity wounds will self seal. As you can see on this negative pressure system, the lung starts to collapse. What this patient needs is a decompression to allow for air to escape um, out of this, out of the area here, allowing for, for the portal space, I should say, um, allowing for the lung to reinflate back to normal. All right, one second. We're going to send a message to one of the students really quick. It's not working. One of the students is trying to access it. I got to send her the access code. Jen's trying to get on. Stand by a minute here. Let's see. Sense. Text this over really quick. I'm right back here. There we go. All right. So the amount of pneumothorax that develops varies, right? Um, so, uh, so suspect a spontaneous pneumothorax in a patient who experiences sudden sharp chest pain and shortness of breath without a specific known cause. What patients are more susceptible to a spontaneous pneumo? Any underweight guys. So tall, skinny males, athletes, right? Athletic males that are tall, skinny. So patients who take a deep breath just before blunt trauma to the chest may also experience a paper bag syndrome as well. So the patient is standing, air will accumulate in the apices of the, of the chest wall of the lung. If the patient is supine, air accumulates in the anterior portion of the chest. Um, tracheal, tracheal deviation is a very late sign and is not seen in most cases of a, of a pneumothorax. Like I keep mentioning before, late signs. 
So compression of the lungs, myocardium, and great vessels cause a ventilation perfusion mismatch, or they call a DQ mismatch. <clears throat> uh, presentation and physical findings depend on the size of the pneumothorax and the degree of the new, uh, pulmonary compromise. So patients may present with tachypnea and tachycardia with this. So the chest wall movement decreases as pressure increases, and the hypersonance um, can be detected with percussion. So we place our stethoscope over the back of the lungs, not the front, over the back side, right, back of the patient, and we just tap. We just tap. The, you know, you can't see what I'm doing, but you can hear it, right? So as we go down, we tap. We look for that percussion, that sound. Right. So as the pneumothorax increases in size, so the degree of compromise also tends to increase as well. So immediately cover any open wounds with an occlusive dressing. Use positive pressure ventilation sparingly with this and reassess frequently. If signs and symptoms show development of a tension pneumothorax, then remove the dressing. Call for paramedic backup for treatment if potential cardiac dysrhythmia and or tension pneumothorax occurs. So open pneumothorax or open injury to the chest wall, which allows um, for communication between the portal space and the atmosphere, right? So limit development of negative uh, intrapleural pressure and the um, collapsed lung portion of the lung itself. Hypoventilation results from increased pressure and decreased lung surface area for gas exchange. Hypoxia occurs as less oxygen is available for gas exchange as well. As air enters the portal space during inspiratory phase, air may exit during exhalation, um, as well as during the exhalation phase, or may remain trapped. I'll show you guys this in the next next slide with the open pneumothorax. So direct lung may be present uh, if the lung <clears throat> was penetrated. So I'll show, again, I'm sure you guys this. The vena cava may also become kinked, decreasing the preload and, and cardiac out output as well. So as you can see here, with that sucking chest wound, um, open or penetrating wound to the chest wall, tachycardia and tachypnea will be present with this. Um, so if we have a sucking chest wound, it may be heard on inhalation as well. You hear the sound coming through and then back out. So air motion is detected as a patient inhales and exhales. So the tachycardia and tachypnea will increase in relation to the level of patient's respiratory distress, right? So if the distress is, if the patient's getting worse, you'll start seeing increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate. So to treat a sucking chest wound um, immediately. So subcutaneous emphysema and decreased breath sounds may become present. So as you can see in the photo here, they're placing the chest seal down. So signs of hypovolemia and cardiac dysrhythmia, as you'll see as well, and sucking chest wounds may also be treated, must be treated immediately by immediately placing your glove hand over the injury, replacing it with an occlusive dressing or a commercial chest seal, and secure it on three different sides, allowing for air to be able to escape but not enter. As far as management goes, for the open pneumothorax, the same as a simple pneumo, when using an occlusive dressing, record type of material that you were used, whether three or four sides were sealed, and any chances or changes noted in the skin color, vital signs, breath sounds, and level of respiratory distress. We're gonna monitor for changes, and we're gonna burp the dressing if the patient presents any signs of increasing distress. Attention pneumothorax is increased pressure that causes collapse of the affected lung and pushes the media sinum into the opposite pleural cavity. Classic signs would be absence of breath sounds on the affected side, unequal chest rise, pulses paradoxus, and tachycardia and dysrhythmias. So as you can see, all right, air coming in through here, white area, air pressing on the lung. You can see the wound sites located here, okay? Lungs being collapsed, putting pressure here, 
trying to get my mouse to work right. Putting pressure in here, pushing everything. Oh, I want to do that button there. Hold on, let's put it back. There we go. All right. Compressing the heart, compressing the other lung, compressing the aorta, and compressing the superior in the uh, vena cava as well. Right. These patients need a, a decompression in a chest tube. So increasing pressure with the thoracic cage leads to accumulation of blood within the great vessels just outside the thoracic cage. So diminished breath sounds you'll find on the affected side. And the patient often reports pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea. So you want to make sure you focus on the ABCs, all right? Make sure you focus on those. We're going to cover open wounds with an occlusive dressing or a non-porous dressing. Um, if signs of developing tension are present, then lift one corner of the dressing to allow air to escape. Call early for paramedic backup to form a needle decompression, right? Get paramedics early for these patients, okay? Early response. A hemothorax is blood, with blood accumulates in the space between the um, parietal and visceral pleura. As you can see here, blood is starting to accumulate inside as you can see down here as well. Results from this would be tears of the lung, uh, penetrating wounds that puncture the heart or major vessels with the mediastinum. Uh, blood trauma and deceleration shearing of major vessels or intercostal vessels, rib fractures and injuries to the lung, as well as life-threatening injuries. So massive hemothorax, accumulation of more than 1,500 mLs of blood within the pleural space can lead to decompensated shock, right? How much blood do we normally carry? On average for an adult. Yeah, be five to six liters, yep. Yeah. So this can definitely lead to decompensated shock, especially if there's more than just a lung injury from, the, from any kind of traumatic in, injury that's there. So possible to completely bleeding out in the thoracic cavity can happen. So remember hypoxia as well as hypotension can develop very quickly. So we wanna make sure we suspect the hemothorax, the patient has signs and symptoms of shock, decreased breath sounds on the affected side, as well as tachypnea, tachycardia, dyspnea, respiratory distress, hypotension, narrowed pulse pressures, pleuritic chest pain, pale, cool, moist skin, dullness on percussion, and decreased or unequal breath sounds, and flat or distended neck veins. For the hemothorax, the pneumothorax with air and bleeding in the pleural space for the hemonumo. Findings and management are the same as the hemothorax. ABCs, administer oxygen and positive pressure ventilation is needed. And if hypovolemia is present, we give fluid boluses. For a pulmonary contusion, most common injury from the blunt thoracic trauma is commonly associated with the rib fractures. Suspect in patients with a flail chest as well, and often miss because of high incidence of other associated injuries. So you have to maintain a high index of suspicion based on the mechanism of injury. What do you think may have happened? If this injury occurred, or this, this incident occurred, based on this mechanism, this patient should have these injuries, okay? Doesn't mean they have them, but they should have them based on the mechanism. So look for those areas and try to find something. Right? Don't bypass it. Expose your patient. Look, listen, and feel. Right? Um, implosion effect or overexpansion of the air in the lungs secondary to a pressure wave result in rapid excessive stretching and tearing of the alveoli. Inertial effect is when strips of the alveoli um, from heavier bronchial structures when alveoli are pulled at varying rates by pressure waves. And a spalling effect is a liquid gas interface or exchange is disrupted by shock waves.
So alveolar and capillary damage cause interstitial and intra-alveolar hemorrhage. So hypoxia and carbon dioxide retention lead to respiratory distress, dyspnea, tachypnea, agitation, and restlessness. Auscultation may reveal wheezes, ronchi, and crackles, which are formerly known as rails. Rails is no longer in our textbooks anymore, even though it should be, but it's crackles or diminished breath sounds in the effective area. So treatment for pulmonary contusion is really supportive. Give only small amounts of IV fluids to improve cardiac output as needed. Monitor your blood pressure, your heart rates, right? And treat as needed, All right? Please do not run fluids wide open. Cardiac tamponade, also known as a pericardial tamponade, is blood or other fluid which collects in the pericardium preventing the heart from filling during a diastolic phase, right, causing those narrowed pulse pressures. This is relatively uncommon and seen more with penetrating injuries to the heart with blunt injuries to the chest. All right, the pericardium attaches to the great vessels at the base of the heart through two layers, visceral and parietal pericardium. The purpose is anchoring the heart restricting access motion movement and preventing kinking of the great vessels. So the space between the layers can hold between 30 and 50 mLs of fluid. So the fluid amounts as small as 50 mLs can cause a reduction in cardiac output, right? That's when we start seeing our narrowing pulse pressures. Reduce cardiac output, hypoperfusion, and hypotension. So the physical findings are very similar to those of attention pneumothorax. So we'll see the classic signs of the cardiac tamponade known as Beck's triad, which is narrowing pulse pressures, GVD and muffled heart sounds. And these only occur in the, in the advanced stage. The only treatment, the ultimate treatment is a pericardial synthesis, where they stick a very large needle into the heart to pull the fluid out in the pericardium. We're gonna, for us in the field, for I, know, I know this one was <laughs> See you later, going. buddy. Thank you. All right. So the initiate large bore IV access provide rapid fluid bolus and maintain systolic pressure between 80 and 90 for a systolic blood pressure. We're also going to call for paramedic backup, and we're going to treat any potential dysrhythmias that we may come in contact with. Myocardial contusion would be a bruising of the heart muscle, which may occur from blunt trauma. Vascular damage may also occur as well. This may also lead to delayed rupture of the ventricular aneurysm. So right or left-sided heart failure may also be present. Okay. Clinical signs will vary based on the area of the injury. Associated injuries would be one to three rib fractures or a sternal fracture. If we have a patient in right-sided heart failure, what would we most likely see? Fluid retention. Yep, and? We have fluid retention in the extremities, and what else do we see at the right side of the heart is failing? We have edema, correct? Yep. What else are we looking for in the neck? Extension. JVD. Yep, JVD. Yep. Exactly. So we're looking for that jugular vein distension as well, the distension in the neck. So we have that. All right. Now let's say we have a patient in left-sided heart failure. Where would the fluid most likely build up? Low extremities. In the lungs, right? So it'll build up in the lungs in the lungs itself. So left-sided heart failure would build up in the lungs. Right side would be more in the extremities. So lower extremities, jugular vein distension, looking for the different failures of the heart. 
Uh, may also be present with a uh, retrosternal chest pain. Uh, may or may not show uh, external signs as well. Crackles may be heard on auscultation. Pulse rate will be irregular. Uh, supportive, provide supportive care. Assess for JVD and pulmonary edema. Call for paramedic backup early and carefully monitor for rapid deterioration. These patients can deteriorate quickly with myocardial tusions, contusions. A myocardial rupture um, is acute perforation of the ventricles, atria, intraventricular septum, intraatrium septum, uh, the cordidae tendinae, uh, papillary muscles, and the valves itself. So causes would be uh, severe blunt force to the chest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Severe blunt force to chest compresses the heart between the sternum and the vertebrae. So penetrating injuries to the heart as well could be a cause. This is a life-threatening event which may uh, present with acute pulmonary edema or signs of cardiac tampon. Is your myocardial rupture? Right. Um, traumatic aortic disruption or rupture of the aorta occurs most often in blunt force trauma. Blood trauma is a result of motor vehicle crash or falls where the aorta is injured at its flexed points due to shearing forces. High percentage of patients have no signs of external chest trauma. So as you can see, the pseudoaneurysm here, right, and this is where the opening is going to be, a rupture. To kind of put it in perspective, the aorta is the size of a quarter. That's our major blood supply. So for the firefighters in the room, that's your large diameter hose. That's your supply line. So assessment findings include retrosternal and intrascapular pain, describing as a tearing pain, dyspnea, dysphagia, hoarseness or strider, ischemic pain of the extremities, upper extremity hypertension with absent or decreased strength in the femoral pulses, hypotension and signs of shock. So what we wanna do is maintain ABCs and transport immediately. Penetrating wounds in the great vessels would usually associated with injuries to the chest, abdomen, or neck. Uh, the large vessels, blood vessels can, uh, contained in the chest would be the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, pulmonary arteries, the four main pulmonary veins, the aorta, and its all its branches. So wounds may cause massive hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, cardiac tamponade, and enlarging hematomas. Blood loss is definitely not evident or obvious, I should say. Hematomas may cause compression of any structure that's there. So if they're building up a, a, a hematoma, it's going to push against something eventually. All right, so this may cause compression. So transport immediately to the hospital, maintain ABCs. Uh, diaphragmatic injury may result in a blunt or penetrating trauma where light, this is definitely like threatening, where high pressure compression to the abdomen results in an increase in inter-abdominal pressure and can lead to bowel obstruction and strangulation, restricted lung expansion causing hypoventilation and hypoxia, and cardiac and respiratory compromises. So injury is separated into three phases, acute, latent, and obstructive. A rare complication is the herniation of the abdominal contents into the thoracic cavity. So the gastrothorax increase, increase interthoracic pressure, both compresses the lung on the affected side and compromises circulatory function. Signs and symptoms of a diaphragmatic injury would be tachypnea, tachycardia, respiratory distress, dullness to percussion, scaphoid abdomen, bowel sounds in the affected hemithorax, decreased breath sounds. So we want to be elevating the head of the backboard or stretcher to keep the abdomen contents in the abdominal cavity and provide positive pressure ventilation as needed for hypoventilation. For an esophageal injury, where penetrating trauma is the most frequent cause, 
This could be life threatening if untreated. So spontaneous perforation may occur in violent emesis as well. So violent vomiting. All right. A carcinoma or an, an anatomic distortion produced by diverticula or gastric reflux. So patients typically present with pain, hoarseness, dysphagia, respiratory distress, and shock. Some signs of cervical esophageal perforation be local tenderness, subcutaneous emphysema, and resistance of the neck on passive motion. Some signs of intrathoracic perforation would be a mediastinal emphysema, mediastinitis, subcutaneous emphysema, mediastinal crunch, splinting of the chest wall. So for this pre-hospital care, for this is really supportive till we get to the ER. Tracheobronchial injuries are very rare. Is caused by a blunt or penetrating trauma, has a high mortality rate, where the site of the injury is often close to the point of attachment and allows for rapid movement of air into the pleural space. Findings would be hoarseness, tachypnea, tachycardia, massive subcutaneous emphysema, dyspnea respiratory distress, hemoptysis, and signs of tension pneumothorax that do not respond to needle decompression. So we need to have early recognition and transport and treat the patient symptomatically. The symptoms come about, we're gonna start treating. Traumatic asphyxia is a sudden severe compression injury of the chest produced, produced by a rapid increase in interthoracic pressure where the forces squeeze the chest and blood backs up into the head and neck, causing the jugular veins to engorge and capillaries to rupture. This is a characteristic appearance as we descended the neck veins, cyanosis in the face and upper neck, extremities and torso, above level of compression, swelling and cyanosis of the tongue and lips, ocular hemorrhage, may also be mild and as well. So you may have a subconjunctival hematoma or extremely dramatic as well. All right, so the skin below the area of compression remains normal color. Um, hypotension then occurs when pressure is released. Early recognition and rapid transport is really needed for this patient. We're going to treat symptoms as they come on. Um, we're going to take cervical spine precautions and, and obtain IV access with two large bore lines.